it is very premature to be thinking about pausing. Until we see progress on inflation, the Fed is really focused on getting inflation uh, down. I think the Fed is just saying, hey, let's be careful and understand we have to get to the destination. It's not about the terminal rate. They're still looking at as high a terminal rate as they need to derail inflation. It does not want to see premature financial condition easing on the signs of any Fed pivot. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz, mm. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures the day after the Fed, lower by two-tenths of 1%. And this bond market on the move, your two-year TK, 470 yeah. this morning. It's really good to look at that. Rounded up, John, 4.71%. This is one of the most interesting days in 20 years. This is completely different than the zeitgeist I'm seeing this morning across media, across a lot of Wall Street. Street. This is fascinating. And if Dominic Constant with us here in moments is great, he calls this a super restrictive Fed. Looking forward to it. What's your number one takeaway from Chairman Powell yesterday? Number one takeaway was late in the interview, Kyle over at CNBC quietly asked him a question about international ramifications of what he and the Fed is doing. And you see it this morning. The Fed is central banker to the world, including central banker to the United Kingdom. A number one takeaway for me and many others, too, that moment right at the end of the news conference, I I think it was the second to last question, Bramo, where that journalist wrongly misled this chairman to believe the market was still rallying. And he just went through the list one by one, one by one, as to why maybe this market shouldn't be rallying. In another way of saying this is perhaps he said the quiet bits out loud, just like Neil Kashkari said it, which is that they do not, do not want to see the market rallying. They do not want to see any kind of loosening in financial conditions. What you're seeing is a higher terminal rate being priced into the market, 5.2 percent nearly being priced in uh, as soon as uh, April, May of next year, which really highlights the shift in markets. How right difficult now. is it to be bullish in this market right now, based on what we heard from this Fed chair just yesterday? Unless you believe that the data is going to really cooperate, that you're going to see some sort of material downshift in inflation that's going to come before early next year, it is hard to be overly bullish, which is the reason why the bears have taken control and people can blame some of the bearish tilt of this program. But honestly, that is really the, what the, basically the Federal Reserve <laughs> is saying. I think you can blame everything on Chairman Powell right I think now. I will. Some people were happy with Chairman Powell just yesterday. In fact, many people were, Tom, and I imagine that's because they were on the other side of the trade. Yeah, they may be on the other side of the trade. I, I can't find words for how sensitive the markets are now. It can be something esoteric like Indonesian rupiah going out to new weakness. Forget about that. It's about the real yield ready to go through a 168 to maybe get out over a 170. You mentioned, John, the, the elephant in the room, the two-year yield, 4.71%. But I look at the currency screen, and if I'm Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, looking at his Bloomberg this morning, I'm saying, what do I do on fiscal? They want a week a dollar. They're not getting one They're just They're not yet. getting it at all. They're not getting that at all. For the chairman to turn around and say he still believes the risks of doing too little outweigh the risks of doing too much, that was a rebuttal yesterday in many ways to all that political criticism he's taken over yeah, the last couple of weeks. I, I, I agree with that. And I think there's an ex-post, ex-ante thing here going on. And the fact is, as Dom Constan will tell us, is they're going blind to a neutral rate. They're, they're search I, I really got that from Powell yesterday. Many, Chris Lowe, I think and others said this was the most interesting press conference in ages. Equity futures down two tenths of one percent on the S and P. Let's whip through the price action for you. In the equity market, a little softer after a dreadful day of losses yesterday off the back of that news conference. Yields a whole lot higher on a ten-year this morning, up by eight or nine basis points, just south of four twenty at the front end of the curve. Though to see the two-year up, up and away, taking out the highs of the year, up nine basis points on a two-year tom four. 71 this morning. Again, it's the bond market. And, John, it's two things going on here. It's yields moving higher, but also a shift in the curve, negative 52 basis points on the vanilla 210 spread. And to see that, John, break down back towards pre and misers negative 60 level would be critical. We're not there yet. You mentioned that dollar strength, euro dollar this morning, Lisa, 97.55. And it'll be interesting to see whether the pound actually also loses value on the
the heels of what may be the biggest rate hike by the Bank of England going back to 1989 at 8 a.m. In about two hours' time, we do get that Bank of England rate decision. That 75 basis point rate hike is coming in the face of weakness. And this is really the dilemma so many people are facing. And perhaps the biggest rebuttal that we heard from Fed Chair Jay Powell yesterday was it is essential to kill off inflation for a stable labor market. Our dual mandate is not in conflict. In fact, it is working together over the longer term. How does uh, Governor Andrew Bailey message that same thing at 8.30 a.m. when they are pressured by a weaker pound, when they are pressured by a fiscal policy that is yet to fully be uh, released? Today, we also get U.S. data, including initial jobless claims at 8.30 a.m., U.S. September factory and durable goods orders, and October ISM services data at 10 a.m. Eastern. I am curious about services. I am curious how much they are starting to lose some of the momentum because everyone keeps talking about how inflation is rolling away from the goods into services. How far can that go? And today we do get a slew of earnings. I am curious about the consumer. Hyatt, Peloton. Peloton, of course, is its own story. Uh, restaurant brands, Under Armour, Carvana, Starbucks, Kellogg's, many, many others. How much do consumers continue to go out and buy? Peloton shares lower ahead of what people expect to be disappointing because people are no longer buying bikes, sticking them in their homes and not going out because that was a pandemic era kind of development. That's what people are basically saying. Carvana uh, has been all over the place, really uh, beaten up. I'm curious about used cars and car valuations in the face of some of the highest rates that we've seen going back to 2009. And Starbucks, how much, John, are people still going out and buying frappes and lattes and everything else, especially as they head back to work? It might be a good kind of reopening trade. Bramo, thank you. Lisa, thank you very much. Joining us right now is Dominic Constant, the head of macro strategy at Mizuho Americas. Dom, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. What a morning for it. Let's just start with yesterday and that news conference. Number one takeaway for you, Dom, what was it? Um, well, the, the, the main thing I thought was actually at least they started to introduce the idea uh, that the cumulative effects of, uh, of monetary tightening to date are going to have to be considered. So there's some sense of mutual and the measure of restrictiveness that's uh, uh, in place and is going to be in place as the forwards uh, are realised. So, th I mean, that was the main thing. There's a there's a shift in narrative. I, I absolutely yeah. agree. It's important that they raise the uh, you know the, the peak funds rate versus their September dots. Uh, but you know that that was that's been going on for a while anyway. So, but the main thing for me is the new narrative, if you like. Dominic, your note yesterday, and folks, you can get it from Mizuho. There's a single classic constant paragraph in there where you say this is faith based central banking, and they risk a textbook type two error, something the laureate Michael Spence talks a lot about. Tell us about the certitude of Fed policy buttressed up against the potential for error. Well, I mean, the, the problem is um, we don't really know where neutral um, rates are um, in the sense of producing or being consistent with price stability. You only sort of observe that after the event. So uh, we can look back at historical data, and because we don't even have that much data going, only going back maybe 20 years, uh, you know, uh, the neutral rate you know, right now, based on that backward-looking thing, would be around 1%. But we could be in a new regime, in which case neutral rates are higher. Uh, and uh, so by, by the, those old metrics... The Fed is definitely super restrictive, um, but they may not be restrictive enough uh, if you, uh, you know, if the neutral rate is is in fact higher. And understanding why neutral shifts is very important. And uh, there are lots of behavioural things that could be going on there. There are structural things that are going on in demographics and globalisation that could <clears> be shifting to neutral. So in some sense, uh, you know, the question is, what does a central bank do in this environment? Uh, and uh, I, I would just suggest they have to be a bit cautious at some point when when they know that on old metrics, they're super restrictive. Uh, perhaps they need to sort of just take a pause, recalibrate, you know, wait, uh, wait out a couple of meetings in the course of 2024 before they decide if they need to carry on uh, raising rates. So it would be a kind of a pause that refreshes a tightening cycle, or, or maybe it, everything will fall into place. And they'll say, phew, you know, we thank goodness we've done enough. Uh, and then maybe they've done too much <laughs> and they have to scurry back the other direction. So that's the issue. Dominic, we were talking earlier at the beginning of the show, John asked, is there any reason to be bullish right now in equities? Because you've got the Fed chair basically coming out and in so many words, not being particularly happy at seeing any kind of rally in the face of this inflation and the need for tighter financial conditions. What's your view on that? I mean, where could there be room for bullishness amid an absolute rebuttal of any type of dovish pivot? 
Well, it's hard to be bullish on anything, to be honest, uh, either either bonds or equities. Um, the uh, the issue for equities, I think, really is down to a hard landing or soft landing. If there's a hard landing, you definitely cannot be bullish uh, on equities. Uh, they have a, a good downside in, in earnings. And, you know, we would su suggest at least another sort of, you know, 10, maybe even 20 percent downside in price on a sort of hard landing. Uh, the, the other problem you've got is even with a sort of softish landing, uh, the, the route to, to a softish landing, as we've always argued, is, is anyway through margin compression. <laughs> so it's, it's earnings coming down. It's just that you don't have to have a massive cost reduction on top of it, which would involve, you know, really sort of shutting down sort of businesses. Uh, so uh, it's very difficult to be, be, be bullish. I would just say that you could do a weighted average of soft versus hard landing outcomes. Uh, right now, by the way, we're not really getting any sense of any landing. Uh, and uh, but you could do a weighted uh, average and you could say that, you know, fair value perhaps is around, you know, 3600. That's kind of where we've been working to. Uh, and, and if the if the clouds you know, are clear and, and the soft landing looks like like it's sort of taking hold, then then you've got upside, you know, up to around 4,000 or so on the S&P. So that's the way I approach it. So, yes, yeah, difficult to be bullish. Um, but, you know, maybe if you're in the soft landing camp, you can sort of use some of this weakness uh, to you know, accumulate, uh, you know, cover some shorts, perhaps, and, and maybe sort of look for some kind of upside uh, down the road. Certainly difficult to be in that camp right now. Dominic Constant, thank <laughs> you, sir, of Mizuho. What a tough moment for those in that camp. Easier to repair the damage of doing too much than doing too little. Yeah, the this is the that asymmetry that we heard twice yesterday. Do you think twice. it's that asymmetric, though? Yes, Tom? wildly. Justin Wolfers at Michigan was brilliant on us on Twitter, and the constant note yesterday is one of the best from Dominic in 20 years. It was brilliant. How much brilliant. comfort do you think Democratic senators who were worried about the damage that's going to be done to the labor market? Zero. How much comfort can they Zero take? Zero did they get out of conference? that. Zero. But I, I tell you, this is an overcome by events screen I'm looking at uh, this morning here. And what Constum said, that this is so important, John, we go from Stanley Fisher and ultra-accommodative to the phrase constant coins of super-restrictive. Mohammed Alari and Bill Dudley, they do not believe this Fed is super-restrictive, and constant says, be cautious. Look where the emphasis is, Bramo. The emphasis right now is on the destination. It is no longer on the journey. Except that right now, as Dominic Costum just said, we're not seeing any type of landing. So trying to envision in the contours of a landing when we're still at 30,000 feet is very difficult. But that news conference was just absolutely... Amazing. Oh, it was historic. It was historic. Of, of all and the press I, I conferences we've covered correctly. together, just absolutely incredible. Yeah, it was just, and, and you know, we're talking snoozes. I got this totally wrong. It was not a snooze fest. Futures down a quarter of 1% this morning. Good morning to you. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell is making it clear he is prepared to raise interest rates as high as needed to get rid of inflation. At the same time, he says the Fed could go to a slower rate of increase as soon as December. Powell spoke after Fed policymakers raise rates by 75 basis points for the fourth time in a row. Meanwhile, in just under two hours from now, the Bank of England is expected to deliver its biggest interest rate increase in 33 years. Economists predict the UK central bank will raise interest rates by 75 basis points in order to cool double-digit inflation. That would bring the base rate to 3 percent, the highest since 2008 and the biggest single increase since 1989. In China, the National Health Commission says the nation's zero-tolerance approach remains a strategy to fighting COVID. And that comes after unverified social media posts boosted hopes the policy would be erased. On Wednesday, China reported the most new COVID cases in more than two months. And big job, job cuts are on the way at Twitter. Bloomberg's learned that new owner Elon Musk plans to eliminate about half the social media company's workforce. That's about 3,700 jobs. Musk intends to inform the affected staffers on Friday. Meanwhile, remaining Twitter employees will be asked to return to the office. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. still have some ways to go, and incoming data since our last meeting suggests that the ultimate level of interest rates will be higher than previously expected. We have some ground left to cover here, and, uh, and, and cover it we will. 
Chairman Powell straight out of the gate in the news conference, doubled down on that statement a couple of times, and this market got really shaken up. Futures this morning, negative on wow. the S&P 500, down a half of 1%. A move lower again in the bond market. Yields higher, much, much higher on a 10-year up 10 basis points, 420. Similar move at the front end, looking at 470 on a two-year. And off the back of that, what do you get? You get some dollar strength. You get some euro weakness, 97.44, negative three quarters of 1%. Heard from some ECB speakers this morning, guys, and it's fascinating to listen that. to what they've got to tell, say. Tell, yeah. President Lagarde says you, that we don't believe that recession will be able to tame inflation. I think that's basically the president talking about stagflation risk. And we had right. another ECB official this morning say this, Tom. It's clear that rates need to go higher, but take a listen to this. In my view, recession in the euro area is a baseline scenario. It's not in the ECB's baseline just yeah, yet. No this is one official. But yeah, so far, it's yeah. likely to be relatively shallow and brief. Here's an individual, Tom, that wants to hike interest rates and do it even if we get a recession. I, I agree. I, I, I totally take that point in the punditry. What I'm going to say, John, and folks, this is so important. And I think this is underreported in the financial media right now. On the commercial break, John, I didn't look at my Bloomberg for 30 seconds, and the market's moved. I mean, you have sterling going down to new weakness now. It's incredible markets. Today, I'm following the 2 10 spread as carefully as I can. Right now in Washington, and this is an important conversation, I've waited over eight weeks to try to figure out what the suburbs of America are doing in the midterm will be in Washington uh, for you for Tuesday, for Wednesday as well next week. Anne-Marie Horton uh, will greet us, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent. There it is, Anne-Marie. Greg Giroux has been on this at Bloomberg, and Catherine Lucy nails it in the Wall Street Journal. The suburban poll, the Democrats have lost the suburbs. Are you surprised? I'm not exactly surprised that we're seeing this shift because the polls prior to this, really going into the fall after the summer, was that the concern for the economy over the things like in, uh, the uh, like abortion were really starting to pick up. But this poll specifically is incredibly important because it's not just the suburbs, Tom. It's suburban white women. And the striking down of Roe v. Wade is something that resonated with them over the summer, but that really started to lose steam. And if you look at this poll, these are the numbers. The top issue, 34 percent, and this is what is going to get them out to vote. And this is a robust voting group, according to this poll, in terms of how many of these women want to get out and vote. They say rising cost is their number one issue. And they say it's just costing too much to live. And that is now overtaking right. any other concerns like abortion. Well, take it to Philadelphia, the land of a no-hitter. And, and, and Anne-Marie, <laughs> let's, let, let's be direct here. Oz Fetterman, is that decided in the Philadelphia suburbs as maybe Trump Biden was? Potentially. Uh, and if you look at this poll as well, Tom, what you can see is that when asked for these suburban women how they feel about how President Donald Trump did as president, it's 50-50 in terms of approve and disapprove, while actually Biden's numbers are trailing in this latest poll. This poll is much worse for the administration and the Democratic Party than the same Wall Street Journal poll they had in August. What do you make, Anne-Marie, of the counter-programming yesterday from President Biden mm -hmm. amid the press conference from Fed Chair Jay Powell? Well, there was a few counter-programmings, right? So the president had an event I was at yesterday, actually, with a number of labor leaders, and it was talking about a talent pipeline. Um, I'm not sure that the Fed's calendar is on the agenda for the White House the same way, say, it's on, it's on our agenda when we do our programming. Um, I think the White House also wants to make sure that they say they're independent of the Fed, so why would it matter if the president was speaking at the same time? And it's... Yesterday was six days. Today, it's five days to the midterm elections. The president is going to do anything he can every single day to have well, some event to make sure he's hitting the base. But to be fair, Ed Murray, the big issue right now is inflation, right? This is one of the top issues, if not the top issue, for so many voters out there who are looking at the economy and looking how much they pay for groceries and for gas and for everything else. So who is President Biden speaking with? Who is he trying to message to at a time when He's definitely creating animosity with the energy companies. He's pointing a finger at the Fed, and some of his own uh, party members are saying that the Fed is acting overly aggressive. 
Well, it's a good question because this is something the White House has struggled with. They struggle to nail a message on the economy. And sometimes you just don't know who the messaging is for. Um, our colleague Nancy has a great report out this morning that really tries to show the circle the president has relied upon in widening that circle when he wants economic advice. Everyone from the CEOs of Apple and Walmart and Target and Brian Moynihan of, of Bank of America to also his grandchildren's field hockey uh, parents uh, when he spends a lot of his time on the weekends in Delaware. Interesting, one group that he's really not engaging with is the oil industry. And that's difficult to understand when it's gas prices that have really infuriated Americans. And this poll in the Wall Street Journal shows that's one reason why they're going out to vote, suburban women. But also the fact that your chief of staff is waking up every single day at 3.30 in the morning and the first thing he's looking at, allegedly, is the price of a gallon of gasoline in America. If you're so concerned, why are you not engaging with the industry? AMH, thank you. Down in D.C., Anne Marie with the latest. And Tom, this is something Will Kennedy and I talked about just yesterday. You've got the war of words between the oil patch and the president right now, but getting lost is effective policy on energy. And I haven't heard uh, enough I, about I, that I over the last few months. No. And there's a history in America of a lack of effective policy on hydrocarbons. There's no question about that. But I would suggest a gallon of gas is, I mean, I grew up as a gallon of gas as a third rail for America. No question about that. I don't think you get that in the three zip codes of Manhattan. But with that said, there's so much more going on here. And the magnitude of the shift of the Wall Street Journal poll, 27 percent, I've, I've never imagined that. I've never framed it. John, it's unimaginable, that shift. That's got to be topic one for the Democrats on this Thursday morning. Well, the party in power playing the blame, playing the blame game, Tom. You've got Democratic senators blaming the Fed. You've got the White House blaming the oil patch. Yeah, well, and I'm not sure if that's it's, sticking it's, with the electorate right now going into the no, midterms. No, I don't think it is. And, and again, the poll is, is game-changing. What Anne-Marie says, what Greg Giroux says, our poll expert, uh, what a guy like Vellier says or Terry Haynes and all, this is a shift poll less than a week before at the election. John, I got to go back to the international uh, markets here. It's a Damien Sassauer Thursday, our EMAs. Is that what you're and, calling it? Uh, you know, is, you, is the United Kingdom an emerging market? Are we having an EM central How bank? How much trouble do you want today? to call? Calls today. I, I don't know. I, what is, hey. How many degrees of freedom has Governor Bailey lost because of Jerome Powell in the last 24 hours? I think they've got a problem through the FX channel, and we've been yeah. talking about that all year. Futures right now. Yeah down four-tenths of 1% on the S&P. We'll continue the coverage. Big moves in this bond market on mm. a 10-year, up around Look 10 basis two points on a two-year this morning to 472. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. Big moves in this market over the last 24 hours or so. We've got futures down by about five or six tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down seven tenths of 1% on the Russell, down a half of 1%. In the bond market, yields are higher by 10 or 11 basis points at the front end, 472. Get used to that. 472, yeah. the previous yeah. high, yeah. was 10 basis points lower than that, and it was a few Fridays ago. In the bond market on 10s, yield tied by 9 or 10 basis points, just south of 420. We've got a problem in the FX market. If you're President Lagarde, if you're Governor Bailey, you've got a weaker currency to deal with this morning. Euro dollar 97.41. Yeah. Euro dollar negative 8 tenths of 1%. That right there, a stronger dollar ripping right the way through G10. That's a weaker euro. John, it's the way it's weaker. It is suddenly and abruptly within the later British morning and the euro just giving out the new weakness. These are, I can't say enough about the nuances of the market right now in the Bloomberg terminal. It's a major move. amazing. Listen to what the chairman had to say please, yesterday. Please. And I think we're all whipsawed after the statement to the I news am. conference. In the news conference, you've got a Fed chair basically saying, we still believe the risk of doing too little outweighs the risk of doing too much. We also believe well, the path to a soft landing has got narrower over the last couple of months. And don't pay attention to the pace of hikes. This is about the destination, and that terminal rate needs to go higher. What's interesting about that last line on the terminal rate is the shift in the September dot plot was already quite large, and now we're set to do that again at the December meeting. Well, let's take one minute here because we got Jennifer uh, McCune here on the Bank of England. We had cumulative tightening, which is associated with a vice chairman, and Neil Dutta, among others, picked that up. And that vapored in the press conference. It, we were up 200, 300 doubt points, and then 
boom, we were down 500. It was straight out the gate. It was yeah. straight it was out like of the gate. It was like chemo didn't exist. It was the first line yeah. almost in the news conference, yeah. and he doubled down on it, and he repeated it. And I keep going back to that moment in the news conference because I think it's so revealing. When he was led to believe this equity market was up, Yeah, he just delivered yeah. what someone told I, me, when I think this is a great phrase. He delivered a hawkish greatest hits in about <clears throat> two minutes in response to that question. I, I'm, I, we're not day trading here, but I'm looking at Sterling right now, 112.38, and the chart is uh, <clears throat> weaker. Let's get a brief on that. Jennifer McCann joins us, head of global economics at Capital Economics, with her work at the Bank of England. As noted, I really can't say enough about the quality of capital economics. Jennifer, let me cut uh, to the chase. Late in the press conference, the uh, chairman was asked about the international ramifications. What are the new constraints that Governor Bailey faces this morning after what Chairman Powell said yesterday? Yeah, I think maybe it, it, it does constrain other central banks a, a bit, this kind of this uh, suddenly more hawkish tone. It's, it's pretty confusing. It's confusing not only for markets, but just generally, globally, for other central banks. Um, it, it, right. it certainly muddies the waters. How is he constrained by domestic economics? I saw one report in the British press this morning of housing prices could decline 15 percent, dare I say 30 percent. How constrained is Governor Bailey by the domestic realities of the people of the United Kingdom. Yeah, well, there are real conflicts in terms of the domestic position for the Bank of England as well. You're right that the economy is clearly weakening. That's having an impact on the housing market, which is a real worry here in the UK. The housing market is really important to the rest of the economy. But on the other hand, price pressure is still really strong uh, in the UK. It's kind of got the, the worst of both worlds, really, where it's hit by this terms of trade shock that the Eurozone has seen in terms of gas prices. but. It's also got the domestic inflationary pressures that are more like the, the US with wage growth far higher than the Bank of England will be comfortable with. So we think it's going to go for a pretty big hike um, today. But the, the big question is about what the messaging is beyond that, whether it indicates that there may be um, a, a slight softening in, in its hawkishness to come. The baseline assumption right now in markets is that the Bank of England is going to raise rates by 75 basis points, the biggest hike going back to 1989 for the Bank of England, and then uh, raise to about a 4.25 percent level where they'll stay for a while. If that base case gets realized, what does that do to the pound? If we get that signal today, does it basically leave things where they are or does it give some support, especially after the disappointments, the sort of disappointingly small hikes that we've seen from the Bank of England recently? Yeah, I mean, it, it might give some support. Our base case is that rates actually go go further than that. We're expecting a peak of 5% um, in the UK, and we, we even think there might be a 100 basis point hike today, just given the, the strength of, of price pressures. But going forwards, going into to next year, we think that it's the weakness of the UK economy that's going to be really important and an increasing risk aversion as the global economy goes into recession. And I think that's likely to weigh on sterling. We heard, uh, and John was just mentioning this, Christine Lagarde of the ECB is warning that recession alone won't tame inflation. She was talking about the euro region. If this applies more broadly to the UK as well, what is the point ultimately of outsized rate hikes? What is the point of this entire hiking cycle if the sole purpose is to reduce activity that may not lead to reduction in inflation, as Christine Lagarde is saying? Yeah, well, I think it... it it may not immediately turn the inflation picture around, but clearly, if you can pull up demand down enough, then that does um, reduce the risk um, that, that wage growth will uh, will continue to spiral, continue to rise. That demand will, will keep will keep pushing up and pushing inflation up further. So, so I think it's largely a matter of timing, and we've got to remember that it really makes sense for the for the central banks to sound relatively hawkish now. If they started indicating to us now during a tightening cycle that cuts are to come, then they're just undoing all the work that they're doing with with the hikes because. Financial conditions right. start to loosen because markets start to price in those those cuts in future. It, so it, it's a really confusing position to be in. But I think I wouldn't read too much into what the central right. banks are saying right now. What's going to matter is what happens to their economies and to domestic inflation next year. Jennifer, there's a cohort of American economists, market economists, who are suggesting inflation can be stochastic, go up, turn right around and come back down. Is that a possible belief at capital economics on double-digit European and double-digit UK inflation that when we can go up and structural economics will bring it right back down to a legitimate disinflation? 
Well, I th think there is going to be a disinflation next year. There are some really large statistical base effects um, in the global inflation profiles. Those apply to the, the UK, the Eurozone, to the US. Um, and it, it is going to be the case that headline inflation comes down. The real question, of course, is what happens to core inflation, whether we see underlying domestic price pressures starting to come down. There's much more evidence of that coming in the US than there is yeah. in the Eurozone. Why is that? I don't mean to interrupt, but I think this is critical. Why is the US different in believing core disinflation can occur and you don't believe that in the city? Yeah, well, I think... It's partly about gas prices. So obviously in Europe, we've been hit much harder um, by, by the rise in gas prices. That's affecting headline inflation, and it has a knock-on impact on inflation expectations. We've got a lot of strikes going on, a lot of discontent about ju just how intense the pressure is at, at the moment. We, we're, we're at the peak um, of, of pressure on, on, the cost of, on the cost of living on people's incomes. That's pushing up wages. And it's, it's, it feels like things are things are building at, at the moment in the European economies and that there's a real risk of, of wage growth going up very sharply. Jennifer, thanks for being with us this morning. Jennifer Mickey on there of Capital Economics, the Bank of England decision about an hour and 23 minutes away. These are single mandate central banks, Tom. The European Central Bank, the Bank of England, they've got to hit an inflation target. And whether they believe they can do anything about it or not, right. they've at least got to retain a commitment to getting it down. And that's the difference between what they want to signal and what they'll actually do. I just wonder, Lisa, if there's a difference between what they signal and what they'll ultimately do, is that a tradable story in the face of what we're experiencing right now? If you don't believe, let's say, Chairman Powell's going to do what he tells you he's going to do, do you still want to be long here? Because this feels pretty uncomfortable. It's a, it, I don't know the answer to that, right? Do you want to play game theory? Do you want to play this sure. game with the Federal Reserve? Because that's ultimately what you're asking. Are you going to call their bluff and say, ultimately, you can't do this? Well, the more people do that, the further the Fed has to go, right? So it kind of has a self-fulfilling prophecy against you. There is a larger question, right, which I think is actually expressed in the bond market. If you believe that the Fed will lack the political will to ultimately do what needs to be done to bring inflation back down to 2 percent, then you do not want to get long long treasuries, because right now you cannot be certain that those yields are going to come down materially in the way that so many people had thought. And that might be one of the distinguishing features that people are kind of trying to grapple with right Sometimes now. we make it, I think, a little bit more complicated than it is. I remember in the last 10 years, you just had some very simple statements for some, from some hyper bullish people who just basically said, the Federal Reserve is telling you what they want listen to them and don't fight them. And hasn't the Federal Reserve just told us yesterday in that news conference, ultimately, what they want. The Fed is not in control. Right now, Mr. CPI is in control. Right now, inflation is in control in a way that we have not seen before, and nobody really understands it. You know, Jennifer McEwen was just saying that she thinks that there's going to be a, a more rapid disinflationary force in the U.S. A lot of people would agree with her, Tom Porcelli among them, which is one reason why they think the Fed will have to back off, and it's not even in the Fed's uh, eyesight. So if the Fed isn't really in control and the Fed's saying, we don't really know, but we want to kill inflation, then, you know, basically you're trading off of economic data more than you are the prognostication of a split Fed wow. that's going to be facing a lot of pressure. Oh, without pressure. a doubt, we're at the mercy of the next two prints from the Federal yeah. Reserve. I don't think anyone's denying that. But in the meantime, they're in control of something, financial conditions. And they've proven that just yesterday by well, smacking the equity market back down again. I agree with that. And if they're saying that they want to bring financial conditions down, so they will. And that's the issue. And the dance, of course, is how do you do that without creating some sort of financial stability problem that causes them to stop before they've really achieved their goal? David Blanchflower had a blistering short tweet today on the disinflation that we're beginning to see in some of the data. It was blistering. He doesn't think the risks are that asymmetric, by the way. Yeah. He thinks the damage you do to the labor market is, is real and difficult no, to that's unwind. What, that's his acclaim. Yeah, there's, that's what he's known for with his classic book, The Wage Drift. John, I thought Jennifer said something absolutely profound there about labor. Here's a headline from The Independent in the last two hours. When are the next train strikes in November 2022 in England. We're not seeing those headlines in America. No, but we are still having conversations and negotiations with unions in America, Tom, with inflation but at like in multi-decade highs. No, the difference is they're actually going on strike. In the United Kingdom. But we're having conversations with unions that might go on strike. Yeah, in like the at United Twitter, States. they're having conversations. I think they're having much harder conversations. Much harder conversations at Twitter. We'll Futures get to that. right now on the S&P are down a half <clears> of 1%. We're down six tenths of 1%. In the bond market, yields up, up and away by 11 basis points at the front end. Let's call it 473 on a two year. Wow. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Central banks in focus again today. At 8 a.m. New York time, the Bank of England is set to deliver its biggest interest rate hike in 33 years. The BOE is trying to rein in double-digit inflation. Meanwhile, Fed Chair Jerome Powell is prepared to raise interest rates as high as needed to get rid of inflation. At the same time, he says the Fed could go on to a slower rate increase, increases as soon as December. President Biden asked voters to consider the future of democracy when they vote in next week's midterm election. In a speech not far from the Capitol, the president urged Americans to reject what he called Donald Trump's big lie, denying his election defeat in 2020. Democrats are trying to stave off the potential loss of their majorities in Congress. In Brazil, President Jair Bolsonaro called on his protesting supporters to dismantle hundreds of roadblocks. He said they harm the economy and aren't a legitimate form of demonstrating. Supporters of Bolsonaro, who refused to accept his defeat in Sunday's election, have taken to the streets across Brazil. And in sports, for only the second time, there's been a no-hitter in the World Series. Christian Javier and the Houston Astros bullpen, they combined to no-hit Philadelphia in a 5 to nothing win. Now that ties the series at two games each. The only other World Series no-hitter was pitched by Don Larson of the New York Yankees in 1956. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. China demand coming back will, of course, have an impact on the market. But uh, we're in a world where demand is sloshing downward around the world. I think there's ample supply in the market for us to not have a big impact in China coming back. That's the constructive view from Ed Moss, the global head of commodity research over at Citigroup. Live from New York City, it's a continuation of what we experienced yesterday afternoon post-Fed. In that news conference, equities down, futures lower, negative 7 tenths of 1%. In the bond market, yields higher by nine basis points, just south of 420 <laughs> on a 10-year, on a two-year, up 10 basis points to just in and around 472. Yields up, dollar stronger, euro weaker, euro dollar holding on to 97, 97.34. Tom, we're down by nine tenths of one percent on that currency pair. Crit critical markets, and John, I'm just going to suggest equities give way here with a VIX out to twenty six point three nine. John, I'm just focused on uh, sterling. You've got to be as we drive towards the Bank of England meeting. What hasn't moved is yen. If you get yen to move out one forty eight out to one forty nine, that sort of confirms everything we're seeing. How does the BOJ respond to that? How do they respond to Powell? I think they're like everybody else. They have less degrees of freedom than they had 24 Operation hours. Operation Ostrich. Ostrich. <laughs> I was about to yeah. say, just head in the sand. There. <clears throat> right now, what we're going to do is address food. If you have your wheat and your Wheaties, and you know in America it comes from Kansas, in the United Kingdom, it doesn't come from the United Kingdom. There's huge food imports into the United Kingdom. This is something Kona Hake looks at, head of commodities research at EDNF Man. Kona, we were talking before this chat about the idea that the microeconomics of wheat, whether it's the United Kingdom or Egypt, Tunisia, whatever, and all the hard, hardship of the Ukraine, buttresses up against the macroeconomics of a combined food economics. Discuss the micro of wheat buttressed up against a difficult macro scene. Yeah, Tom, it's, um, the situation is literally two stories where you have the wheat supply demand fundamentals, and this is not just for wheat, by the way, it's for a lot of the soft commodities, where supply has been really tight. Reserves, global reserves are actually historically quite low. Um, and you have this situation where you're trying to marry tight supply demand fundamentals against a macroeconomic backdrop that is really quite bearish, where you have recessionary fears, you've got rising interest rates, you've got rising energy costs and lower consumption trends. And when you have that, I think the futures price tends to follow that outlook more than the immediate supply demand tightness. And that's the trade-off we're beginning to see. And as a result, you know, these wheat commodities that ultimately are priced in US dollars, um, right. what you see is a gentle de decline. What do you see for higher single-digit food inflation? How do you break that? Is it about breaking oil prices? How do you I, – I get housing, how that dynamic works, but how do we move away from high single-digit food inflation? 
the food inflation story was a while in the coming, right? So we we knew from a year ago that this was happening, um, even, even even before actually, in the middle of COVID, they were going up. This is going to, it's sticky. It's not going to disappear overnight because you still have freight and supply chain issues that, and the energy costs and fertilizer costs, all of this, which is pushing up food costs. On top of that, and this is particularly for food importing countries who price their food in US dollars, on top of that, they have a massively rising food import bill in their local currency terms. So this is really adding to the cost. So for this inflation to now start coming off, it's not going to be overnight, that's for sure. Kona, What's you- helping is that Yep. Well, no, but this is the issue, right? So there's this delay kind of feeling and it eventually will take time to come over. And uh, food is something essential, unlike uh, gasoline or oil in the same kind of way in terms of people being able to reduce their consumption of oil more easily than perhaps reducing their consumption of food. How do you buy into or not some of the declines that we've seen in crude valuations, Kona, given the expectations for a slowdown or even recession? Well, it's an interesting comparison because if you look at energy prices, so crude, for example, they're stable at $90 per barrel. Yes, OPEC held the cutback in OPEC, but it hasn't fallen to the lows of 50 that we saw um, at the beginning of the pandemic. And I think you're going to see the same thing with food. They're coming off. They're not definitely not as high as they were just before the Ukraine invasion, but they're also not coming back to the lows that we saw two years ago. So I think that's the situation. The fundamentals have shifted to a slightly higher structural phase where the sticky food inflation means that your baseline has moved up a little bit higher. When it comes to crude, Amrita Sen uh, came on our show and said she does not expect crude valuations to go back down to that $72 level that the U.S. administration has pinpointed as a potential time to start refilling the strategic petroleum reserve. Ed Morris uh, came on yesterday and said he does think we could get there over the next 12 months. Where do you sit on this? So OPEC has shown that they're targeting a $90 per barrel level. Um, I think if they hadn't intervened, or they will be in November, I, for sure I think prices would have gone to the 70 level. Um, now, how quickly and how effectively they can get the discipline together and enact that cut, cut might be effective. If they are not able to do that, then I think the recessionary implications are so severe. Yes, it would get a 70. But my view, my base view is that OPEC will do what they can to try and le- keep it at above 85. Kona, thank you. Kona Hack there of ED and F Man. The takeaway there, the same takeaway that we've had in every conversation so far this morning, it's high for longer. It's high rates for longer. It's high food prices for longer. Yeah. That seems to be the takeaway across the board here. It's the X axis treatment, and that's where you get back to this phrase yesterday, a bombshell phrase codified by the Vice Chairman Brainerd of cumulative tightening, the cumulative effect of this sustained inflation is tangible. It's the reaction function here for me, Tom, that stands out across the board. And, and changed. Echoed by the ECB as well. This has been the story for the last number of months, but I think everyone finally capitulating around this story, that if we get a real weakening in the economy weakness in the labour market, a rollover in the broader economy. They are telling you that they aren't going to cut, Tom, anytime soon. They're trying to push out that story way, way out through next That's year and into 24. That's script, but as Dominic Constum said, and I'm going to go to Stan Fisher as vice chairman years ago, he coined the phrase ultra-accommodative. And now you've got Dominic Constum super restrictive. A lot of people disagree with that, but we're there. I mean, what we saw yesterday is the here and now of neutrality. There are a lot of people this morning that just don't believe him. They don't believe it, Lisa. They still think you might get cuts next year. When this economy rolls over and this guy's truly tested, he'll capitulate. But I've asked this already this morning. Is that a tradable story? If you disagree with them right now, if you think ultimately they can't go forward with this, this is just about signalling and no follow-through, is that something you can actually trade on? A lot of people are trying. I'm just looking right now at Fed Funds futures, and the expectation is for a peak in June of next year of about 5.2%, uh, a little less than that. And then they go down, right? By the end of the year, it's 4.9%, not a massive uh, decline or a massive cut. But the question is, how much is Christine Lagarde avant-garde in her comment this morning, right? That basically even a recession won't necessarily kill off inflation, especially because of what Kona Hawk is talking about, that there are these sort of sustained higher prices in the real world economy that uh, rates are just not going to fix. How does the Fed, how does the ECB respond to that? Do they push fiscal policymakers to borrow more money and spend at a time when uh, rates are really high? Uh, What's the solution? The takeaway in the last 10 years was don't fight the Fed. And fighting the Fed was being short the market. Now it's flipped. Fighting the Fed right now, in the near term at least, 
it's being long the market. Which raises a question of whether it's just an opposite retracement of what we saw over the past decade or whether this is a unique period. Across the board, it's the last decade in reverse. Futures right now, down six tenths of 1% on the S&P. From New York, this is Bloomberg. It is very premature to be thinking about pausing. Until we see progress on inflation, the Fed is really focused on getting inflation uh, down. I think the Fed is just saying, hey, let's be careful and understand we have to get to the destination. It's not about the terminal rate. They're still looking at as high a terminal rate as they need to derail inflation. It does not want to see premature financial condition easing on the signs of any Fed pivot. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. It feels like that news conference ended about five minutes ago. Yes, we've well just said. picked well, up where well we said. left off. Well said. Thank you, Tom. Well said. We thank you from New York City this morning. <laughs> good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, equity futures oh. down six tenths of one percent. The pain TK continues. It continues and it continues with a different flavor. And John, it's, I, I thought our last hour was just brilliant. Thank you to our team for a great set of bookings. We continue with Binky Chadi here uh, in a moment. John, what, what I notice here is the markets are speaking, and this is where the Bloomberg terminal really comes in. It isn't just about the stock market or even FX. It's the sum total to your yield, 4.72%. The message simple, slower. But higher, up 10 basis points at the front end. Tom mentioned the two-year, 472 right now on a 10-year lease are up 10 basis points, 420. I'm honestly, I'm just watching the front end and watching the repricing up higher of, an, of a higher terminal, yeah. a, a terminal rate. When does this create some real pressure that we haven't seen yet? Have we seen the bulk of it? Do people start to understand, as we heard from Dominique Constum, that it has to come from margin compression in order for the Fed to be happy? That's the, the soft landing is margin compression, so that's not exactly great for the equity bulls. Cue the White House. Some earnings from the oil patch. ConocoPhillips boosting the share buyback <clears throat> by $20 billion, Tom. This morning, it's just a windfall. Just a call twenty. Are we going to get a windfall tax? I mean, where is this before the election? We're not going to. I mean, that was not a talk. concrete proposal earlier this okay. week. It was a threat. Okay. And I think the market saw it as just that, a threat, not without even. any realistic proposal on deck that we can actually follow through with. Yeah, I mean, you know, Afterthought was going to Sephora and she said we need to windfall profits here. You know, she wants, you know, the, the, the flow. You can tax you know, the children. I'm taxing the children. We're, We're thinking of doing it. Well, the way they're going through it, Just yeah, Just to recuperate absolutely. some of the money you give to them. But that talks about the stresses that are out there. We mentioned <laughs> oh, the Washington stress, Post Tom. poll. In America, <laughs> there's some too. serious stresses right now. You're seeing it in the poll data. Oh, without a doubt, the, the economy front and center. These are two combined stories. Elisa, you've mentioned this a few times. We all have. Whatever we discussed today about what happened yesterday in the news conference. It is all at the mercy of the economic data that is still to come. We have CPI on November 10th next week. We have CPI December 13th. And then shortly after that, I think a day later, the Federal Reserve gets set to go again. And at that meeting, we'll have the projections for next year and the year after. That's why it's hard to really uh, say, let's just go with the Fed, don't fight the Fed. What is the Fed wanting to do? They don't know where inflation is going to go. And I think they're pretty clear about that. The balance of risks is definitely weighted more heavily to not going far enough. And that is bearish in and of itself. But it is very unclear if we start to get some sort of disinflationary kind of fault force that we heard from Danny Blanchflower, what that does. OECD Paris, out moments ago, 10.5%. Sure. I believe that is double digit. Germany's a piece of that. The Eurozone yeah. is a piece of that. Yeah. Double 10. digit 5. CPI, Tom, across the board. UK, 8.8%. And could get worse. Yeah. This is something we've talked about. You can make the argument maybe that we've seen peak year over year inflation in America. We yeah. can debate about how long yeah. that will persist. In Europe, I think you can make the argument it's still in our future, not in our past. And that's problematic for these policymakers <clears throat> facing down higher inflation and also right. their economy rolling over. I think you got to do a data check. I mean, I mean, I, I what's going to. on here? There's, there's just, to. I'm sorry, but it's an, it's an exceptionally interesting screen today. Binky Chatter, a Deutsche Bank dropped by, so we're going to catch up with Binky in just a moment. A whip through the price action just for you, Binky. Futures down six tenths of 1% on the S&P 500 in the bond market yields higher by 10 basis points. 4.20 on a 10-year, 4.70-ish on a two-year euro dollar negative seven tenths of one percent stronger dollar weaker euro 97.47 tom Keane on euro dollar what a move yeah and 
and you see, you know, you see the Dow move 800 points yesterday. You see the Dow outperform through all of October. I would suggest that Mr. Why do you Chata, smile when you say Mr. The Dow? Chata is focused on the Dow Jones Industrial Average and that quality big cap move that we saw. I don't think Binky's got a Dow forecast. You don't think so? <laughs> I don't think he has. I think we'll avoid that, and Ramo can tell us what's coming up through this morning. Just whipping you through it, we've got the Bank of England rate decision in about an hour time. I wonder how much that's going to change the conversation at all. 75 basis point hike is what's expected. The biggest going back to 1989. Uh, Governor Bailey does speak uh, about a half an hour after that. Today we get a number of U.S. data points, including initial jobless claims. How much do we actually get some sort of shift upward in that? U.S. September factory and durable goods orders and ISM services data for last month. How much do we start to see a little bit of a softening in services? And earnings do continue. A lot of focus on the consumer today, Tom. And I'm wondering, you know, John, if we see all of these uh, companies reporting how much we see the bifurcation come up with some sort of story other than just the haves and the have-nots with strategy and with consumers that they're trying to attract. Well, we've seen that with tech versus oil, energy, and we see that again this morning in energy. Pleased to say, here's the proper introduction, Binky, just for you. Binky Chatter, Chief Global Strategist and Head of Asset Allocation at Deutsche Bank, joins us right now here in New York. Morning, Binky. Good morning. What did you make of yesterday? That felt brutal for the bulls. So, so actually, you know, I wanted to start with uh, respectfully disagreeing with you uh, very modestly about... Uh, you, can, you can disagree with me as much <laughs> as you like and you can be rude about it if you want, Binky. You, you, you started by asking whether the, you know, the, whether the meeting for me yesterday is over and what... You know, that struck me as I think the meeting from that began in March is not over yet. If you look at the S&P 500, it is absolutely glued to every measure of the Fed and Fed speak. And I think, you know, more importantly, looking forward, you got to keep in mind that this window that we've seen of being so off the S&P 500 being so closely tied to rates is is not the normal pattern even in past rate hiking cycles. So you have to ask yourself, you know, what is different? Why is the S&P 500 married to the U.S. 10-year yield or the two-year yield? Depends on your taste. Uh, and and you know what what I would argue is that basically. I, 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 perhaps, and, and we all tend to look basically at risk assets or equities and the 10-year yield, but I would argue it's an open question as to whether it is actually really a concern about the level of yields, which is the numbers we were just talking about, the two-year at a new high for the cycle this morning, uh, you know, or, 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 or is it really, you know, the speed which has given rise to basically all of the volatility that we've seen? If you take a look at the move index, it's, uh, you know, almost 100% correlated with uh, the U.S. 10-year yield. Sure. So that, and, and, and so you can't really tell rates from volatility apart. I would argue it's been much more really about the volatility. If you look at the move, we are back at basically the peak in uh, March of 2020. We are, you know, outside of the financial crisis, uh, the global financial crisis. You know, we were here in uh, Russia, LTCM. So, you know, this meeting has been going on since March, and it's been running like an emergency meeting now uh, for quite some time. It's an and, interesting and way of framing it. the pattern is an aberration. So let's talk about the volatility. If you believe it's the vol mm -hmm. and you're bullish, mm -hmm. then you've got to make an argument as to why volatility is going to come back down anytime uh, soon. Can uh, you make uh, that uh, argument now? Uh, you, you can make uh, uh, several arguments. Number one, of course, is, you know, if you look at a chart of volatility, it looks like a spike. If you look a little closer, it's been rising for quite some time. And with this kind of volatility, either something breaks, mm -hmm. and that's a separate discussion, or it comes back down. Uh, from a fundamental point of view, I would argue, you know, clearly, in, in, in terms of from where we started in March, and, and, and where, you know, we need to go we are probably a right. lot closer to the end than the beginning. Okay, uh, you're, you're, and, you're, and so it's really about predictability and, and, and getting that vol down. You're, and, you're uh, one of the great bulls in the street, just because of time, Bick, I want to cut. Everybody wants to know, you reaffirm a bullish call, you maybe take it into 2023. I'll cut you some slack on that. In your experience, how do corporations adjust to what I see on the Bloomberg screen? Mm -hmm. How do corporations adapt to get into a constructive chata
2023. Uh, so, so, you know, there, there's really two points to make here. Number one is basically how they reacted historically, basically to recession or concerns about recession, which is, you know, cutting and basically preserving and, and, and protecting your, your cash flow and parking it on your balance sheet. And I would say right now, the signs of that are, you know, uh, you know, on a scale of one to 100 or around eight or 10. So it's very, very low. Uh, and, and you're just not seeing that. So yes, uh, you know, Fed hiking cycles, you know, lead to recessions. But the, the, the sort of, you know, this playing out is happening very, very slowly. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I think last summer we were pretty close. I would say since then, corporates have, you know, basically said, you know, I just cut preemptively in uh, the pandemic, and yeah. that really didn't work out very well for us. So, Thank you. Market's been hammered. Not in a hurry to do that. Let's finish here. Do you believe the Fed does have control over financial conditions? Uh, I think that, you know, if you look at a chart, uh, so let me draw you a simple chart. It's a butterfly chart of uh, the Fed hiking and what rates are doing and what equity markets have typically done. You can go check out even, uh, you know, Mr. Volcker's hikes of 1980. This cycle is unique in the sense of But I understand the world you want. Sold. I want to talk about the world we've got. Yeah, this the is world the world we've, we've got. got right now. Mm -hmm. And your call's not working. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to work out mm -hmm. why it will. Because this Fed chairman made it pretty clear that he doesn't want financial conditions to ease anytime soon. Yeah, it, 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 I, 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 I think it's uh, really, I would characterize it as basically Fed uh, overreach. Uh, you know, historically, the Fed hasn't really talked about uh, talking down equity markets and talking up credit spreads. Uh, and, 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 you know, it, it, it will work, that fever of uh, the March meeting continuing <laughs> until now sure. it, it is going to break or it's going to break something else, you know, uh, it, it, and, and, and there's just sort of no two ways around that. So in terms of, uh, you know, talking down uh, or tightening uh, financial conditions, you know, it's a strategy till it works and, and it is going to stop working at some point. Yeah. Binky, it's working right now. Futures down yes. six tenths of one percent. This is tough for the bulls. Binky Chandler at Deutsche Bank. Thank you. With Tom Keane, Lisa Ravitz and Jonathan Farrow. Jeff Yu coming up in the next hour from BMY Mellon. Your equity market down six tenths of one percent on the S and P. From New York, your bond market yields higher, much, much higher on twos and tens. Your two year through four seventy this morning. Your ten year having a little look at four twenty. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. At 8 a.m. New York time, the Bank of England is expected to deliver its biggest interest rate increase in 33 years. Economists predict the U.K. central bank will raise interest rates by 75 basis points in order to cool double-digit inflation. Now, that would bring the base rate to 3 percent, the highest since 2008 and the biggest single increase since 1989. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell is making it clear he is prepared to raise interest rates as high as needed to get rid of inflation. At the same time, he says the Fed could go to a slower rate of increase as soon as December. Powell spoke after Fed policymakers raise rates by 75 basis points for a fourth time in a row. The U.S. has condemned what it said was the test launch of an intercontinental ballistic missile, ballistic missile by North Korea. The launch came a day after King Jong-un regime fired off at least 23 missiles. The State Department urged North Korea to stop the launches and return to talks over its nuclear weapons program. And big job cuts on the way at Twitter. Bloomberg's learned that new owner Elon Musk plans to eliminate about half the social media company's workforce. That's about 3,700 jobs. Musk intends to inform the affected staffers on Friday. Meanwhile, remaining Twitter employees will be asked to return to the office. And shares of Qualcomm are falling. The biggest maker of smartphone processors gave a far weaker forecast than expected. That showed that the market for consumer devices is eroding faster than feared. Both the economic slowdown and COVID lockdowns in China are hurting sales. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
We know democracy at risk is at risk. But we also know this. It's within our power, each and every one of us, to preserve our democracy. And I believe we will. The President of the United States on the campaign trail going into the midterms next week. From New York, the price action, equities continue moving lower on the S&P 500 near session lows, down by seven-tenths of one percent. Yields up by nine basis points on a 10-year, just short of 420 on a two-year in and around 470. In the FX market, dollar stronger, euro weaker, euro dollar 97. 42 and in commodities crude holding on to 88 88 dollars and about 50 cents we're down by 1.7 percent talked a lot about that federal reserve meeting a 75 basis point hike a hawkish news conference then it's on to payrolls tomorrow the estimates so far in our survey tom 200k yeah, the previous number 263 30 seconds here john we fractionally moved away from the tension of an hour ago i get that but nevertheless we go into governor bailey what does he say today does he have a press conference like chairman powell lisa informs me there is a news conference 30 minutes after the decision where he's looking for something like 75 basis points it's the forecast of the bank of england i'm interested in because i think it's tremendously difficult to put them together before we get a deeper understanding of what this government is going to do with the budget. I so we see a forecast today without a fiscal budget. We should get forecasts okay. and they should have some idea. Of course, there's going to be a range of outcomes in those forecasts, a wide band, Tom, to accommodate the right. idea that maybe you get a shift in fiscal policy. But it's going right. to be interesting nevertheless. Francine Lacroix with the governor of the Bank of England here later oh, that's uh, great. this morning. What I'm not sure what time. time. I, I don't know what time. I, can't, I don't know if it's English time. New York time, I can't. Four hour time difference you know, now, you know, TK. Is it four hours? It's because of daylight savings then and summertime. Back to five. It goes back to summertime. five this weekend. We go from BST to, to GMT, I believe. Someone expert on BST to GMT, Amory Horton, joins us now for years in London uh, with Bloomberg, now our Bloomberg Washington correspondent. Amory Farrar, as we brief as we come to, to Washington next week for uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I, I hope the dark in the door of Martin's Tavern out in Georgetown. It'll be fun. Forget <laughs> about the fun, Amory. Brief us on what's the difference for Republicans between 51 senators and 54 senators. How big a difference is that? Well, they would maintain this control, right? And there's a number of issues that the Democrats were able to get ahead of and vote on because they had the majority in the Senate. If the Senate is really what it's going to come down to, Tom. I mean, the House, the projections really show that the Republicans are going to win there. But whether or not they can gain control of the Senate, that is going to be key. And depending on how we wake up that next morning on Wednesday, we right. may not actually even know. But it is a big deal. If the Democrats are able to uh, maintain control of the Senate, then it's a complete gridlock. There's something Wall Street does like. If you do see Republicans gaining that control, there's going to be a lot more issues uh, that they're going to right. take up with the administration, things like impeachments, et cetera, and bills that they may be able to send to the president, but that he can veto. Which Senate race are you focused on? I think for me, I'm going to be focused on Pennsylvania because the margin just completely keeps narrowing. And it was very sad to watch on a, per, on a, on a human level. But I think that debate and individuals going out after that debate really questioned um, if Mr. Fetterman was able to do this job. It is the highest office you can run for, obviously, besides president. So that's one of the debates I'm going to watch because the Democrats had real hope and momentum to flip that from Mem and Oz, and this is really a, a purple state. Anne Marie, how far have we moved away from elections at this point, just being a referendum on Trump? Oh, that's a great question because the president is not Trump, <laughs> right? It should be a referendum on. President Biden, but I think Biden said it himself yesterday, outlining in this speech about democracy that it is still about the former president and what the current president Biden would call, quote, MAGA Republicans. He really took to the fact that, he, in his words, democracy is on the ballot. He's talking about the fact that political violence and the Capitol Police statistics show this has been up since 2016, since the former president Trump took office. And obviously, he talked about the fact that what just happened recently in California with the speaker's husband, Paul Pelosi, and the fact that this attacker came in repeating words that we heard at the insurrection on January 
January 6th. Where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? This clearly is something that the president has felt deeply about, and he wanted to take this moment six days before the midterm elections to remind voters that it's not just about the economy, it's not just about abortion, it's not just about prescription drugs, democracy is on the ballot. The big question is whether or not this is really going to move individuals in how they vote. AMH, thank you. Anne-Marie Hordern over in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. This coming from the Wall Street Journal. AMA sent this to me a couple of minutes ago. The majority of Americans support continuing aid to Ukraine in what will likely be a prolonged war with Russia, but support is becoming a partisan issue as Republican opposition grows to helping the country, according to a new Wall Street Journal poll. If Tom, the, it's becoming the, problematic. Yeah, if the president was a Republican, would we be having this discussion? I don't think so. Perhaps I not. I think it's just a minority... You know, go after the majority. Thing. You don't it think it gets the worse as are. the economy gets worse as well at the same time? Uh, no, I just, I just think, it's, think it's, it's a theme. Issue. It's a partisan theme of a minority saying let's push against the majority president. Futures That's right simple. now down seven tenths of one percent going into those midterms. Next week, this equity market's lower, bond yields are higher off the back of a very hawkish Chairman Powell in that news conference. I think many people are absolutely whipsawed by the dovish interpretation of the statement yesterday, Tom. And yeah, I think we yeah. hawkish no. news conference. Now, the Fed speak now is going to be fascinating in the coming Can, weeks. Well, brief us. You follow it more than I do. I think you it's a bunch of more. One marking, official but... leaning into the statement and another official leaning into the news conference. Is that going to be the new joke, like transitory? I've is, heard a lot of people you know... say that the statement was about the vice chair, Brainerd, and that the news conference was about appeasing the hawks. The chairman's job in the news conference is to reflect a consensus on the committee. That's Agreed. his job. He can't just be speaking about what he thinks, in my opinion, this, this, that, and the other. He's got to be reflecting the consensus. So, how of the alone committee. is the vice chairman? I don't think she's alone. I think they all realise we've got work to do. It was the emphasis of the news conference that mattered most. And I think he managed to do what we all said would be the major challenge. We went into this and we said the challenge for this Fed chair is to indicate that they're open to smaller rate hikes without triggering a premature easing of financial conditions that would undo the work they've already done. And, Lisa, based on that very narrow question, most people assume this chairman did a fantastic job in that news conference yesterday. A lot of people do, and, and people subtly point to the point that he made, which is their dual mandate is not in conflict. That, in fact, it longer term, in order to get the labor market where we want it to be, you got to bring inflation under control, period, full stop. And that, that is the main risk. Winnie Caesar's coming up, the global head of credit strategy at Credit Size. Looking forward to that. Equities down by seven-tenths of 1% on the S&P. The Federal Reserve behind us. The Bank of England in front of us. That decision coming up in about 35 minutes. We'll catch up with Lizzie Burden over in London to break that one down for you. What a crazy month it's been in the United Kingdom. This is Bloomberg. Rita Nazareth of Bloomberg with the data point of the morning, I think, the stat of the morning, if you will. The worst Fed day price action on the S&P going back to early 2021. Brutal. Equity futures right now down seven tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100 down by nine tenths of one percent. The pain continues. It's all about the news conference with Chairman Powell. It's no longer about the journey. It's about the destination. We'll go slower, <laughs> but we'll go That's higher. So sensitive. Therapy, Tom. It's it all is, about therapy. You know, you're, Keeps me you're very showing sure how vulnerable Keeps you are. Keeps me very sane. You're I'm very vulnerable, vulnerable too. You know, I'm you're all about vulnerable. feelings and emotions, Tom. Yeah, in the bond markets, who's tens and thirties look like this? Emotional move in a two-year up nine basis points yes. through 470 on twos. Pain in the ten-year up six basis points, seven, eight basis points higher, close to 420. Pain. Pain for who? Let's talk about that in the FX market. Painful for any central bank trying to engineer some currency strength against the US dollar right now. Euro dollar, Tom, with a 97 handle, that currency pair negative this morning, down and down hard. It's the way it's down, and we saw that 90 minutes ago, John, and we need to watch it. There's been a pause here, but I'll tell you, coming off the theatrics we're going to see at 800 uh, from uh, Governor Bailey, you really got to wonder how these currencies react. Yields up, dollar stronger. Next move is from Governor Bailey in the Bank of England in around about 29 minutes. That's the price 
nice action. Let's get you some movers. We can do some single names now with Bramo. Hey, Lisa. Hey, John. We're really looking at a bunch of different earnings that were particularly some of the losers this morning. Peloton, you can't really blame Sex in the City and the potential for some sort of heart attack. Those shares lower, plunging by 17% pre-market trading after lowering their year-ahead forecast. It's really tricky when people are actually still going to the gym now and going back to living their lives the way they used to. Under Armour shares are rising 6.4%, even though there was a bit of a disappointment in some of the forecasts. And Marriott, interestingly, again, trying to make sense of some of these share moves, uh, down 1.6%, even though they actually increased some of their forecasts. This really goes down to the year-to-date price action, considering that Under Armour is lower by 66% year-to-date. How much more pain can we bake in? On the flip side, the real just clear winners, full stop, have been the energy companies. And just some of the earnings that we have been getting confirms that ConocoPhillips coming out, $20 billion of share buybacks. It sort of feeds into this question of how much political pressure will there be, and not just in the U.S. Jeremy Hunt over in the U.K. also proposing windfall taxes on some of the oil majors. Chenier Energy is set to report earnings and Transocean up more than 6% after also delivering uh, some better than expected results. Tom, again, how do you deal with this as a politician at a time when you kind of need them well, to be invest investing and you need them heading into the winter? There it is, the windfall debate, and it will, it will continue. We know that for certain into the end of the year. Just today, somewhere in the vicinity of two-thirds of the way through the Fed discussion, there was a modest note from Citigroup, and they framed out a 5% two-year yield. To discuss that, Winnie Caesar joins us now, Global Head of Credit Strategy at Credit Sites. Winnie, how does your world change if the two-year yield moves from 4.70% to 5.00%? What actually are we going to live with a 5% two-year yield? Well, good morning, Tom. Thanks for having me. I think that the conversation around a 5% yield, both in the front end in the two-year, is important, as well as in the long end of the curve with the 10-year, where we've had a lot of clients asking oh, whether Lord. we're going to... I, I know. You is know, it I about Halloween? Was, is it like a Halloween no, after no, effect? No, there we just, go. He's really disappointed that we could only buy $10,000 worth of those uh, <laughs> I-bonds for his future savings. He's really set on buying a monster truck for himself when he's older. So hopefully we get there. I like that. But clients have been really focused on what ha happens if we hit these 5% levels, both in the front end and in the long end. And I think that the 2% 10-year yield or the 5% two-year yield discussion is really important from kind of a credit risk perspective, whereas the two, the five percent ten year yield is really important from a duration risk interesting, perspective, interesting. and the the performance in credit portfolios this year has been equally neg negatively impacted by both credit and duration risk. So clients are trying to figure out, okay, which bet do I take now? Do I say a recession is coming, extend duration? And things right. are going to be okay. Or alternatively, am I going to just get whipsawed again with the 10-year going to 5%? In your world, Winnie, and this is not the world of our listeners and viewers, how do you link the two-year yield move up with what we see in the new LIBOR OIS, the FRA OIS through 50 beeps this morning? This is all esoteric, folks. But all you need to know is in Winnie Caesar's world, yields up. What does that mean to you? How do you link them? So yields up has a lot to just do with market liquidity functions and really what has been happening with depository institutions and less smooth functioning in the treasury market more broadly. We have seen over the course of this year as the Fed really started to do Q QT and then kind of amped up its bond roll off. The Treasury market liquidity has eroded pretty considerably, and this has been particularly true in the front end of the curve, which is why we're seeing a lot of just really challenging movements on the LIBOR side of things and in just the front end of the Treasury market. Given the uh, volatility that we've seen in, ben in benchmark rates, how much can you get behind this assertion by J.P. Morgan's Bob Michael yesterday on Bloomberg TV with John uh, when he was saying that investment-grade debt really is the ballast, the sort of calm in the storm to hang on to, despite some of this underlying volatility? Yeah, so I really respect that view. We've been very constructive on U.S. investment-grade debt. With all-in yields at 6 percent in USIG, Historically, that's actually a level where you can buy high yield and perform pretty well in portfolios. So to have 
a cohort of companies that are much stronger fundamentally at a 6% yield feels really good. I think that what's really tripping investors up is the percentage of spread that contributes to that all-in yield is much lower than it has been for the past 10 years, just because government treasury yields are so much higher. So investors are really trying to wrap their head around how much credit risk can I take and feel comfortable with? I love this 6% all-in yield. And what we're telling investors is the IG universe has a lot of flex in their liquidity, in their balance sheets, in order to weather a continued economic deceleration. Winnie, given all of this, though, how much do you have to look at some of the technicals, right? This question of the LDI concerns over in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom, perhaps not in the same form, but forced selling from some big institutions that have been hit with massive mm -hmm. losses, some of which, and I'm talking about the private debt and the private uh, equity world, might not have been realized yet. Yeah, so the liquidity side of the conversation is really interesting, especially because one of the top things we heard from investors coming into this year was, we're reducing our allocations to USIG. We're reducing our allocations to US high yield. We realize that yields are going higher. We realize that policy tightening is upon us. And where people were going, floating rate asset classes, CLOs, leverage loans, private credit, private equity. So there is the potential that we continue to see kind of this re-rack in terms of asset allocation. But the benefit to USIG and high yield is a lot of investors started their years underweight those asset classes. And so there's a pretty good case to be made that they should be rotating into something else. The question is, you know, how much liquidity did they kind of preserve or put on hand at the beginning of the year instead of putting all their eggs in the EON basket or in the private credit basket? Uh, Winnie, when we look at short-term paper, and I guess we've got to look to December as well, does the Fed part our game and the Fed speeches that we're going to get, I can't imagine what they're going to be like here in the coming days. When, when we look at the speeches, does that actually affect short-term yields? Or are they now just a beast out into 2023 to stay elevated? I do think that the, what the Fed governors end up saying over the next few weeks is going to be important. We've seen why, a lot why of volatility. Why in what way? In what way? We've, we've seen a lot of volatility in the terminal rate that's priced in to the Fed funds futures market just in the past 12 hours or so. Now with a terminal rate well above 5%, about 5.18%, we're going to be very focused on the conversation around lag effects and kind of the appropriate pace of tightening right. from here on out. Do you Who knows? Do you, I don't mean to interrupt, Winnie, but this sure. is just absolutely critical. Do you think various and sundry Fed speakers will talk back what we heard from Chairman Powell yesterday? I think that there is the potential that there will be more of a focus on the lag effects and a slower pace of rate hikes from here on out. Whereas Fed Chair Powell was very much focused on kind of that overall higher destination in terms of Fed funds, I think that the pace and kind of the path to get to that destination is still highly uncertain. There's still a lot of economic data to come from now through the end of the year and, you know, let alone into next year. So I do think that the Fed speakers are going to be focused on that lag effect between policy tightening and actual economic impact. Because when we talk to our analysts at credit sites who cover all of these companies, they're definitely seeing some signs of kind of transition in terms of inflationary pressure and also transition in terms of expectations for next year, which indicates to me that there is some deceleration in inflation. There is a deceleration in growth. And the Fed kind of needs to acknowledge that and that the pace of tightening needs to be much more reconciled with kind of the lagged impact of policy tightening on actual economic conditions. Winnie Caesar, thank you. Winnie Caesar of Credit Sites. Did we clarify whether Mini Caesar was long this equity market, Tom, buying into this weakness? We didn't go. Did we get any clarity equity. on we that? We didn't go equities with it. We went we mostly did, we like did. a two-year yield in it coming in as well. And, and okay. I thought it was really nuanced between the duration game of fixed. Just income. to be clear, I said mini Caesar, not yeah, yeah. Winnie Caesar. The, yeah, the, mini, small, the smaller version. The mini uh, Caesar actually had been long going in yesterday's meeting okay. and was very upset and was expressing incredible I, displeasure. That's, I think that's which understandable. It's, it's understandable. That's we understandable. all feel it. The bulls have been shedding a lot of tears through this year, Tom. Futures are down eight tenths of one percent.
Darren May is going to join Winnie us. Caesar. Mini Caesar, not Winnie Caesar. Anyway, coming up, the head of research over at FX Strategy and uh, at HSBC. Looking forward to that. Yields are higher, stocks are lower. We're down eight tenths of 1% on the S&P. What a moment. What a moment in this market off the back of that news conference from New York. This is amazing. This is Bloomberg. you up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo central banks in focus again today at 8 a.m new york time the bank of england is set to deliver its biggest interest rate hike in 33 years the boe is trying to rein in double digit inflation meanwhile fed chair jerome powell is prepared to raise interest rates as high or as high as needed to get rid of inflation now at the same time he says the fed could go to a slower rate of increases as soon as december President Biden asked voters to consider the future of democracy when they vote in next week's midterm elections. In a speech not far from the Capitol, the president urged Americans to reject what he called Donald Trump's big lie, denying his election defeat in 2020. Democrats are trying to stave off the potential loss of their majorities in Congress. Nature has given the British government a break. Unusually warm weather in the UK last month brought down the cost of the government's energy subsidies by almost 296 million. The unseasonably high temperatures meant households haven't switched on their heating as early as they would in a normal year. Peloton has delivered a weaker outlook for the current quarter than Wall Street was predicting. The fitness company revenue was 37% below what it was a year ago. Still, CEO Barry McCarthy said Peloton is beating its own timeline for a turnaround. Shares are down about 90% over the last 12 months. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. As long as inflation remains elevated and way above the Fed's uh, target, it's really going to be focused on getting inflation uh, down. I think for the foreseeable future, so until we, we see progress on inflation, the Fed is really focused on getting inflation uh, down. The former Fed Vice Chair Richard Clarida joining us on our special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance covering the Fed decision. Fantastic to catch up with him. This market is down, not just inflation. That's the effort here for the Federal Reserve to get inflation down and to get the market down and keep it there, apparently. Equities are down by nine tenths of 1% on the S&P. Yields are up by eight basis points to 418, and this dollar stronger, euro weaker, euro dollar 97.40. TK, we're down by eight tenths of 1%, and this Fed chairman couldn't be clearer, could he, in that news call for us? Yeah, we went from cumulative, he would like. cumulative tightening, what, John? Up 300 Dow points, bam, down 500. Uh, Liz, Liz Ann Saunders just had a great chart out of the S&P and separately uh, the Dow as well, and it was like two events. It was a statement, Hammered. and then boom, Hammered. just completely different. And then kept doubling down on the statement, too. And you know, you, you see it in the deepest market, which is foreign exchange. You had a 113DXY. Yen hasn't moved, not part of the story today. John, what do we do with euro? What does Lagarde do with a euro, like a 0.97, well, 0.96? Well, I think the question for people in FX right now, we trade in rates or we trade in growth prospects? Because uh, rates that's are going really, up well, that's well in said. Europe, and growth prospects are Rolling over. Yeah, well, there we are. Let's do it now with Dara Meyer joining us, head of Research Americas, head of FX Strategy at HSBC. What are the ramifications of DXY breaking through 1 to 13? What are the ramifications of resilient and then stronger dollar as HSBC is nailed for three, four, five years? Well, it's been going well. Thank you. Can I just say, and it pains me to say this, good call John yesterday on the coverage around the Fed, because you got the statement. He said, well, hold on, we haven't had the press conference yet. And that absolutely turn things yeah. on your head, as you all said. So sorry. John did well, but I didn't I'll do well. I'll take that. Yeah, well, he's he shone yesterday. Yeah, you know, Derek yeah, okay. just knows that it's my turn to buy the round while we go for drinks exactly. next. And That's exactly oh, okay, well. very good. No, but let's continue. Strong dollar. What's it mean, a oh, wise well, one? I think... I think what's curious is the way you framed that question earlier. Is like, are we talking rates or are we talking relative? Why can't we talk both? It's, it's both about rates and global growth, not U.S. growth. And I think that's the mistake the currency consensus has made. It's, they've looked at the U.S. economy and said, hey, our interest rate sector is slowing. That will temper the Fed. That will temper the dollar. But the reality is the dollar is trading off deceleration in global growth because everyone's having to hike rates. Um, 
On the US side of the equation, as has become abundantly clear, amazing work by the Fed yesterday to be able to get us on a slower trajectory for rates without fostering a massive risk on move, without fostering kind of, oh, this is the end of the tiny side. I mean, that they must have spent long and hard thinking about how they're going to do that. And so I thought cleverly done. The hawkish step down, right? I mean, this is sort of what people were expecting and what they delivered on. So I don't understand, though, what could change the story that you just said, because you have a Fed that's hiking rates potentially to a higher level than previously expected. And you also have a U.S. economy that's better than so many of the others and more resilient. So what's going to change the dollar story throughout next year? Well, I think the data, I mean, honestly, that's what we'll end up coming back to. If you get you know, two or three months of core CPI printing 0.2, our non-farms coming in 100,000 or less, then that allows the Fed to say kind of our work is done here. That, that's the key. Um, but uh, the market's just so impatient for that. They want to say, well, let's anticipate that and, and, and you know, expect that to come in 2023. But the Fed's saying, we've been getting this so wrong for so long on inflation we got to see the numbers. We can't anticipate the numbers. So right now you're projecting a terminal rate of four and three quarters to five percent. The market's actually ahead of you. Yeah. Uh, the market's above that. Where do you think you're right and where could you potentially upgrade how high you see rates going? Well, look, on, on one day of the week, the market looks more dovish than us and the next day of the week, they look more hawkish than us. You know, that's just the reality of the market. Um, so I don't draw too much from that and, and nor do I spend a lot of my energy fretting about where the consensus is at. Um, it's clear the momentum, and, the, and this has been true of this dollar bull run. I, I compare it to the... the um, the road trip with your kids. You know, you set off and the kids immediately start saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? This has been no. the dollar bull run. Every moment in this dollar bull run, the market has said, right. is that dollar peak? Even yesterday, do you think that's the dollar peak? <clears throat> Why? I mean, the Fed's still telling us we'll keep raising rates. Global growth is slowing. Risk aversion is pervasive. Mm -hmm. You're going to buy the dollar, at, at least for the next couple of months, I would have said. Let's take a random tea leaf. I did Thai bot back to 1999 after the big blow up after the crisis and we're out three standard deviations which is 0.8 standard deviations more than we've ever seen how does the world adapt to jerome powell when they're looking at that depreciation or devaluation well look we're, we're in that environment again aren't we of our dollar your problem um, and for, for economies that are fighting inflation, a weak currency is a problem. But, but frankly, what can they do? I mean, look at the Japanese. They've tried. They stemmed the flow. But the reality is there's is not a great a deal to be done. Is this can listen to Bangkok and the 47 other Bangkoks that are out there? I don't think we're at the point, and I think the Fed will, will take this view, that we're not at the point where the destructive element of a strong dollar is, is such a problem for the global financial system that we kind of have to navigate towards some kind of exit. We're just not there yet. And if you've still got core inflation at 6%, you've still got you know, an unemployment rate that's historically low, the, the Fed will say, you know, we've got work to do. And, and that's what they're telling us. Right now, I'm just focused on the euro when that reaches a breaking point. I mean, we've seen it sort of hovering underneath the uh, parity level. At what point does it become a problem that either triggers the Fed or triggers the ECB in some capacity, even if it's not the gig to play? Yeah, I, I think it's already a problem. It's already a problem for the ECB. Um, but the problem is, what do you do about it? There's not a great deal to be done. You know, the ECB has belatedly matched the Fed for pace, but there's no way they're going to match them for level. So let's pretend we get to a point where both central banks have stopped. You're going to be sat on a dollar that's yielding considerably more than a euro. You're getting paid, literally paid for doing nothing, which is just fantastic. Um, so you know, who's not going to do that? And if you've got the bigger issue for the euro, I think, is let's think about what you do with the dollar to your point about rates and growth. When, when the Fed raises rates, you buy the dollar because rates are going up and because growth is going down, you know, risk aversion. When the ECB raises rates, OK, you might buy the euro because rates are going up, but then you're selling the euro because European growth is going down. You've got that ambiguity around the euro that the dollar doesn't struggle with. And that's why the dollar throughout this year has been buy the dips, grind higher, grind higher, despite everyone saying, hey, is that the peak? We've got about 30 seconds. I was speaking to Bob Michael yesterday, Lisa mentioned that earlier on, and he talked about the calm before the storm. Do you get the sense this ends with this cathartic moment of just this massive, massive demand for the US dollar, the kind of breakout we saw in March 2020? Are you anticipating that kind of thing again? I, I view it slightly differently. I think we've been on a reasonable dollar trend, so like a boat trundling along the water towards the ferry port. But as you come into the ferry port, the stopping point, all the propellers come on, all the volatility, everything yeah, yeah, gets yeah. churned, and then we kind of settle. And maybe we settle into a port like a trading range for 2023. 
that's what I think we're heading towards, not necessarily some massive capitulation or final dollar surge. I think it's more about the vol that we'll get as we as we near the end of these cycles. The best storyteller in the business, TK. <laughs> Isn't that great? I just, by the time we start churning at the ferry port, I'm over the edge seasick. <laughs> yeah, you, the you kids haven't are made, complaining. You, you haven't made it I, on the car The Martha's trip to the Vineyard ferry, ferry <laughs> coming out of Hyannis, coming out of Falmouth. I would lay down. I'm not kidding you. I would lay down as they left the harbor. You drop the kids Just off like before the, you got John, there. This is like no. This is like no waves. No waves. <laughs> Dara Mayer of HSBC. Dara, fantastic to see you, Cheers. buddy. Nice as always. You. Equity futures down by eight tenths of one percent on the S and P. We yeah. didn't get a trade. He gave dollar. us a framework. Stick framework. with the dollar. Framework. Jeff Yu of BMY Mellon is going to join us with a trade, a trade next from New York. This is Bloomberg. very premature to be thinking about pausing. Until we see progress on inflation, the Fed is really focused on getting inflation uh, down. I think the Fed is just saying, hey, let's be careful and understand we have to get to the destination. It's not about the terminal rate. They're still looking at as high a terminal rate as they need to derail inflation. It does not want to see premature financial condition easing on the signs of any Fed pivot. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlitz, and Tom Keane. An historic moment after an historic press conference. John, I'm going to go to the jaw-dropping headline. The Bank of England looks for an eight-quarter, two-year recession starting now. The central bank goes 75, a 75 basis point interest rate hike from the BOE from 225 to 3%, a 75 basis point hike. And in the forecast, Tom, if, and it's an if, we get a two-year recession if rates follow the market curve. The peak interest rate, though, here's a bit of pushback that we didn't get yesterday from Chairman Powell. Chairman Powell encouraged a higher peak rate. The Bank of England saying this, Bramo, just moments ago, the peak interest rate likely lower than in by markets. So a pushback against that peak view in this market. Financial markets pricing in a path that heads to 5.25% in 2023. So they're pushing back against that. Also interesting, saying that the inflation rate uh, will likely peak at 10.9% this year rather than the previous peak expected of 13%. So perhaps seeing some disinflation from some of the recession that they see, the eight yeah. quarter recession that is starting right now. Sterling weaker, 11207. We're going to get a 111 handle here on a week or sterling through uh, the morning as well. John, this seems like it's in a vacuum because they don't have a fiscal policy within the political turmoil of the nation. That's what will be interesting about the news conference. What kind of assumptions are they making on fiscal policy? Because if all reports are suggesting from this government right now, we're going to get a lot of spending cuts, Tom, a lot of spending cuts in the next budget. I, I just don't understand it. I just This isn't in the textbooks. This isn't in beg is the big British hey, Tom, textbook. It's, it's not in there. It's been a total mess in the United Kingdom. This 75 basis point hike was set to be a whole lot bigger than that at one point five, six weeks ago. So that's a big change relative to what we expected only a month or so ago. So you get a 75 basis point interest rate hike from the BOE. Cable's down to about 112. The front end of the gilt curve yields up by two or three basis points. No drama there at about 294 and a 10 year up three basis points to 342. Outside the Bank of England, working through all the details of this decision. One of the best. Lizzie Burden joins us right now. Lizzie, your takeaway from this decision this morning. Uh, well, it's exactly what markets and economists had expected. And if they'd gone for 50, as some were saying that they might, like City or ING, it would have been bad news for the pound. Uh, but thankfully, the comms have worked this time. The groundwork was laid for this. It is, as you say, much smaller than had been expected at times in the period since the last decision. There were times when markets were looking for 200 basis points because of uh, the need to deal with trussonomics. Uh, interesting, the vote split here. We were were expecting 7-2. The dissenters were Swati Dingra. She voted for a half point. Silvana Tenreiro went for a quarter point. 
Dinger, of course, outed herself as a dove at the last meeting, her first meeting. We knew Tenreiro was a dove already, but this is because of uh, their worries about the recession risks. You'd have expected Ramsden and Mann to go for 75. They went for that in September. Uh, but really, these forecasts, I don't think you can take too much from them. As you say, the BOE is flying blind here. We don't know what's going to come in the November 17th fiscal statement, uh, it's particularly on energy. Of course, uh, you've got the impact of the energy bailout, but we don't know what's going to happen after April in terms of the energy support, uh, in terms of what it happens, what it means for inflation. So uh, I wouldn't read too much into that, but interesting that they're pushing back against the market expectations for rate hikes down the line. That's already what Ben Board, Ben Deputy Governor, had been saying. Lizzie, what kind of assumptions do you think they have made about the future of fiscal policy? Well, I have to say, Rishi Sunak, when he was Chancellor, was known for over, uh, not leaking, shall I say, but uh, preparing the markets and the press about what he was going to do. And Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak have been doing that. Uh, managing expectations in recent days. Uh, so we can expect there to be tax rises, we can expect there to be spending cuts, and the BOE will know that. But of course, they cannot factor that into this decision too much until it's uh, confirmed on November the 17th. Lizzie Byrne, an outside the Bank the more of England. The Treasury does in terms of the heavy lifting, in terms of tightening, the BOE has to do less. Lizzie, thank you. Wonderful work. As always, TK, 75 basis points yeah. from the BOE. Very quickly here, let's frame this out. It's on the edge of Draghi. We didn't see this with the Fed at all. They have the presumption to guess out to the fourth quarter of 2025. You get a multi-year forecast from Is the Fed. Is that like a British thing? No, you get a multi-year forecast from the Fed, don't you? They tell you when they think, think inflation is going to be in 23, I, I, 24. In this, in this environment, I, I'm stunned that they do that. I, I just I agree. They're basically looking towards deflation I, I can't into get, 2026. Tom, I can't get past the next week. Yeah, exactly. Ne never mind into 2024. Exactly. It's going to be a great conversation a little bit later. Don't miss it. Francine Lacqua sitting down with the Governor of the Bank yes. of England, Andrew Bailey, will bring you some of that interview at 12 p.m. Eastern time. What a tough time that man has had, and the Chancellor, and the former Chancellor, uh, and the Prime Minister uh, and the former Prime Minister in the last couple of does months. It, does he have to go see the Queen of the King when he's made no, governor not in the of same Bank way. of England? Well, okay. you think he hikes 75 and goes to see King yeah, Charles? Yeah, you know, I don't know. If only he could scoop Gives down. him a brief a phone call the night before. Let's do this. We had Dominic Constant of Mizzou with us. Thanks for your many comments on what Dr. Constant talked about. Now we talk to Jeffrey Hughes, senior market strategist. BNY Mellon as well. Jeff, I don't even know where to begin mm -hmm. other than, I think, an emotion of our listeners and viewers. Is the system near breaking? No, it's not in the UK, but dare we use that P word, unpivot. There's a key line here. There are clear signs of the cost of living crisis taking hold on, on economic activity, suggesting more gradual approach was warranted and over tightening in policy. Right. They are worried about over tightening. They're worried about hitting the afterburners at exactly the wrong point in the household cycle. So some doubts are creeping in. Uh, and I think that's where we are. This is really very different from where the Fed is right now. Actually, everyone else is different from the Fed is right now. You look at Norges earlier today, um, it looks like Europe is starting to pull away or rather pull back. Well, that's exactly where I wanted to go, Jeff. How much is this really representing a sea change amongst, among central bankers? The fact that one uh, committee member on the Bank of England's committee did did vote for a 50 basis point hike, another 125 basis point. How much is that the dissent that you're going to increasingly see around the world that will eventually filter back to the Fed? So it is only going to start to increase. Um, uh, starting in Europe, again, we saw it in Norway today. It didn't seem like 50 basis points was on the table, um, even though um, you know that was where the market um, was. And now we're going to start to only see increasing dissent of not um, pursuing things as aggressively. The Fed, however, um, so I think you mentioned this early in, uh, in the program, you know, our dollar, your problem is going to take quite a bit for them to start to worry about international conditions. Um, because from the U.S.'s point of view, it's about tightening conditions in the U.S. The U.S. economy is still doing well. So there's no obligation for the Fed to take into account wider conditions. How long can this last, Jeff? How long is, can this divergence where the dollar is the preeminent trade and continues to strengthen? Is that an entire 2023 kind of trade? So it will last longer than markets um, expect, but more crucially, from, from a positioning point of view, it will last longer than markets hope. 
right? So there will still be repeated efforts, the pricing of Fed pivot trade through equities, you know, through bonds, you know, through FX, you know, through the dollar and the like. But I think there's still a few more rounds of disappointments um, to come. We look at you know, where Fed terminal pricing is, you know, right now it's going up, whereas everywhere else now, it's probably going to start coming off. Jeff, we've been discussing whether you should be trading growth expectations or rates when it comes to the euro, when it comes to sterling. And Lisa's been building on that in this conversation too. Based on what the Bank of England has just said, is that positive news for sterling that they're pushing back against the higher terminal rate that would have actually hammered growth over the next couple of years? Um, I think initially it's not, um, to be frank, um, because uh, if the market's still working off rate differentials you know, between the BOE and the Fed, um, so you know, that correlation needs to snap back right after the mini budget uh, kind of trashed it. Uh, so if that correlation um, does snap back, you know, then on a cable point of view, you know, then uh, sterling is going to struggle. Um, but uh, if you think uh, that not as tight policy, if the household is going to get some relief, um, then uh, growth is going to be slightly better in the UK compared to the Eurozone, compared to Scandinavia, then relative value trades, and you know, that could start to uh, come through. We just look at intra-European divergence, but the dollar is still going to reign supreme at this point. We're getting a bonus round, Tom, with Jeff Yu. How cool is that? It's good. Jeff's yeah. going to stick no, with great, us. Great, 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 great. Jeff Yu of BNY Mellon sticking with us. The <clears throat> Bank of England hiking rates 75 <clears throat> basis points. Sterling against the US dollar, 112.30. I should point out, Tom, end of September, 103.50 on cable. So we're a mile away from the mess yeah, of a month or so ago. That, but that was a political hemorrhage, if you will. And, and I, you know, I, I look, it's a third, you know, we talk about, the, I, and I have trouble with the phrase Black Wednesday. I think for Americans, they don't know what that means. The answer is 1992, the world of England blew up. It's a 36% devaluation of pound sterling over the last 30 years. This guy has a chronic nature to it around all of this, you know, day to day that we're talking. And about. it's been feeding Lisa higher inflation expectations in the United Kingdom. And this is the this is really the the conundrum for the Bank of England. And I'm very curious to see the evolution of some of the dissenters of how many more of them come to the to the yeah. table and say it is not worth inflicting more pain to try to get inflation under control because we might not have that much control over it Should anyway. We? And check it out, the pound is weakening anyway. Should we call Catherine Mann, see if we can book her tomorrow? <laughs> the seven cool? C block. Man used to come on all the time. Oh yeah, to gig at the I've known her for years. Never this is great. Her. Do you like, just never hear no, from her anymore. No, she didn't send me, you know, I, I didn't love catching Halloween up with Catherine. Her, you know, OECD, whatever. Catherine would come on. City, yeah, Catherine would come great. on. Gets to the Bank of England. No, I don't want to talk to you guys anymore. Where's the violin? I mean, really, it's people like, are that, crying. It's, it's, that it's that a massive violin. I think violin. we'd all like to hear from <laughs> Catherine, man. After could you, could you see, we could are be you? in London, <laughs> in the food court in London with St. Paul's behind us. Are the drinks there Ca on the With the drinks, you know, beef eater gin. We would have Blanche Flower and Catherine Mann. That would be like lightning. Crossfire. Yeah. I, I'm not be... sure that's a great sell for Catherine Mann. Oh, I think Do you want to come and get great. berated by Danny Blanche Flair for raising interest? No, she'll give it right back. She's tough as nails. I know she is. She'll, she'll throw a chalk but at who him. But who wants to face down just Danny shouting at you because you hiked rates? I don't, I, you know, I, I don't just think, think anyone wants to engage Man Blanche Flower would be just a great panel we could do. I'd like to be a fly on the wall back in the day with, with Blanche Flower and Mervyn King. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't that yeah. have been fun? Posts and there, too. These, these are really bright people that agree to disagree collegially. Equities negative today. Sterling negative, too. We're down by 1.4% on cable, 112.36. Was that a real invite for Catherine Mann, if she's listening? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Sure. For Dr. Of Mann, course. always. Gin and, and Blanche Flower. She'll be like, I'll take the gin. Did you see, I don't did know you about see the word cumulative in here? I don't see it anywhere. From Nobody's New York. being cumulative in London. This is Bloomberg. you up today with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo in pakistan former prime minister imran khan has been wounded by gunfire his spokesman says he was shot in his leg but is safe the attack took place at a rally in the eastern punjab province khan was leading his supporters toward pakistan's capital islamabad to demand early elections the U.S. has condemned what it said was the test launch of an intercontinental ballistic missile by North Korea. The launch came a day after Kim Jong-un's regime fired off at least 23 missiles. The State Department urged North Korea to stop the launches and return to talks over its nuclear weapons program. The reopening of China is the dominant theme for traders the last few days. 
Chinese equities rallied Tuesday and Wednesday following unverified social media posts that signaled Beijing is set to move away from its strict COVID-0 strategy. But stocks slumped again today after China's top health body reiterated its commitment to the policy. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. And it's basically made it very clear that they're emphasizing the longer more than the higher. It's not just up and then back down. The Fed's going to keep that peak in interest rates for quite some time until they actually see the improvement in the underlying inflation outlook. That was Bill Dudley, Bloomberg opinion columnist and, of course, former New York Fed president. Equity futures this morning are negative off the back of Chairman Powell yesterday. The follow through pretty negative from yesterday <clears throat> into this Thursday morning. Tom, futures are down by seven tenths of one percent. You Jeff, seem you, very excited. I'm What's very wrong? excited. I've never seen this before. Translate, John. Jeff, you with us, but I got to go to uh, John Farrell here. Can you imagine Secretary of Treasury Yellen coming out with a statement 15 minutes after Jerome Powell <laughs> releases a cumulative <laughs> tightening statement? I have the Chancellor of the Exchequer sure. managing the message in real time on the monetary events of his nation. Never seen it. Chancellor Hunt wants limited interest rate rises. But I think there's some acknowledgement here, before we sort of jump too many steps ahead, there's some acknowledgement of their contribution to what is happening with interest rate hikes in the UK. So Chancellor Hunt goes on to say the top priority is to grip inflation. Difficult decisions need to be made on taxes <coughs> and spending. There is an understanding here in this government of their contribution to the idea that we were expecting higher interest rates and more rate hikes still to come potentially. And what they're going to do is come out with right. a statement in the next month or so, a budget that's going to involve tax hikes and spending cuts, which will, <coughs> in theory, stop the Bank of England from hiking right. more than they otherwise would have done. We rip up the script off this historic moment with Jeffrey Yu. He's senior market strategist, BNY Mellon. Jeff, thank you so much for continuing uh, with us. Jeff, how do you spell austerity, United Kingdom style? What's it going to look like? Uh, well, the, the, the uh, Tories are going to try to not call it austerity, um, if anything, you can bet that. Um, but they're just going to the Chancellor's statement right now. There are political calculations here. The UK government wants limited interest rate rises um, because you know, that translates you know, into higher debt servicing burdens um, for homeowners, right? The bulk of which the Conservative Party will consider you know, their natural constituency, um, for example. Um, but at the same time, the BOE and uh, the governor has mentioned this in the past as well, you know, inflation, you know, that could widen inequality as well and that's a society uh, wide issue so I think these statements are driven um, by you know, different motivations and targeted at um, different groups um, here um, but uh, let's see uh, what happens uh, when the new fiscal plan uh, comes out right so uh, now the onus is uh, on number 10 and number 11 to work together uh, to make sure that the risk to that two-year recession view from the BOE uh, that is a kitchen sink forecast and things can only be better than that so we'll see you know what uh, the chancellor comes up with so, Jeff, do you think that we're on the cusp of perhaps a, a buying opportunity in the United Kingdom or foreign investors starting to see some stability and a sign that they can start uh, to try to find some value? So let's go you know, by, um, so uh, on an individual asset class basis, right? So gilt markets, um, I think uh, there's a, not going to be as much in volatility uh, as uh, in the past. And I do think uh, that people are going to start to look at the long end of the gilt curve or the belly of the curve and say, right, if this is where the BOE is, uh, then scope for aggressive steepening um, is um, going to soften to some extent. Uh, so they could revisit uh, that uh, mark as well. In terms of equities, again, the FTSE 100, 70% of that is international earnings. We're taking a view on the global cycle, less to do with the UK. But the FTSE 250, that is certainly going to continue to struggle because that is tied to the UK household and certainly the household is in for a world of pain up ahead. As for sterling, as mentioned earlier, it's probably still relative value because where the Fed is, you know, you can think what you want about the BOE, where the Fed is right now, the dollar is still going to try to lead. You know, you said something about the kitchen sink approach, and this is what a lot of people have been looking for. People have been wondering when we're going to start seeing companies really uh, downgrade their earnings per share, when you're going to start seeing central bankers say, we are going to go into recession. In this case, an extremely long one, uh, eight quarters, is quite long to be projecting. At what point can that give people conviction for some sort of capitulation and a beginning of a new bottom? 
Uh, well, frankly, I'm eating my own words here um, because I think, you know, with um, the last round of forecasts in August, um, it was six quarters of household um, real income declines. I call that kitchen sinking the forecasts, right? So the risk is you think you've uh, kitchen sink the forecasts and then you realize, well, OK, there's another sink out there. So uh, that, that that is something in terms of guidance, be it on a corporate level, a central bank or a nation. They really have to be careful at this point in the cycle. No matter how bad you think things are, there's still right. the possibility that things to get worse. Right. So that means that's where you need to be really careful. I, I really can't emphasize, folks, the movable parts this odd Thursday morning. And with that said, Jeff, for you, my theme has been degrees of freedom. How constrained is Governor Bailey? How constrained is his team, Catherine Mann and others here? Do they lose degrees of freedom because Jerome Powell saying 5% two-year yield or bust? Right. So on the international side, absolutely, uh, it's it's done. So don't even assume that you're going to get any degrees of freedom you know, from, from the Fed side, from the dollar side. So try to manage your currency, make sure you don't import as much inflation and just hope that you know, energy prices can continue to um, settle. Um, but on the domestic um, side of things, I think they'll try to push the chance around. Let's say you need 50 billion in savings. Please focus on the revenue side because the revenue multiplier is close to zero, you know, according to the IMF. But the fiscal spending multiplier, be it spending or cuts, that is non-zero. So the more you can lean on tax rises, on the revenue savings, the better. The more you lean on spending cuts, uh, that is going to be worse than for the economy. Um, but then it's going to be a political estimation and uh, Governor Bailey will have no input into that. Hey, Jeff, wonderful. Thank Just you, sir. Fabulous. Jeff, you. Elf, BMY, Mellon. Jeff, thank you. Ian Shepherdson of Pantheon Macro had this to say just moments ago on Twitter. Please. Powell, I'm going to hike and hike until I blow the house down. Bank of England, nah, not doing that. And then he goes on to say, poor Sterling. Cable, 112, 23. And that's the difference between the Fed yesterday pushing to price in a higher terminal rate and the Bank of England this morning. And others. Pushing back against the idea and, and of a higher I terminal rate. I believe it was rate. Norway that came in a little bit light today sure. as well. We're starting to see this effect. John, I, did, I forget this number. I just didn't have it memorized. The average U.S. recession is about 10 months. How do you... How as an institution do you adapt to a two-year recession call? If rates are priced where rates are priced right now in the market, that's the if for the Bank of England right now. Tom, for me, though, it's the reaction function of these central banks through a recession. It's going to be very, very unusual to see the economy enter recession potentially. In the UK, it could be just around the corner, in the United States as well. And central banks not cut rates. Because Did I... Lisa, that's what the telling us, isn't it? That we could go there and if it happens, you know what? We might not cut this time around. Because we're dealing with inflation. And it might not even be healed with respect to the uh, rate hikes that we're expecting, if you believe ECB's Christine Lagarde. Going to Ian Shepardin's quote, I, I, I'm yeah. just still thinking about this. We're going to blow the house down versus, nah, no thanks. At the same time, the U.S. economy is much stronger. Is it a relevant comparison to talk about these two economies in the same breath, given their different battles that these central banks are battling? Do you have that nursery rhyme, that little story, the three yeah, little pigs and yeah. the wolf and blowing the house down? Yeah, of course. Just checking. No, Tom didn't. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. He doesn't remember. Yeah, of course. He you start it with, you we start it with straw, no. then you do it with yeah. wood. Jack had dinner early. <laughs> Father played with Kate. Jack needed burping, so Nora had to wait. <laughs>is loaded. Mike McKee around the table with us, Tom, in the studio to break down jobless claims due any second now. Equity futures going into that on the S&P 500, deeply negative through most of this morning in the bond market yields much, much higher uh, by eight basis points on a 10-year to 4.1784. Your equity market down three quarters of 1% with the data. Here's Mike McKee. Uh, interesting, John. No change in jobless claims for last week. 217,000, which is uh, less than the 220,000 that were forecast. So uh, if Jay Powell is looking for some sort of relief from the labor market, he's not getting it yet. A lot of talk from companies about maybe pausing hiring or uh, letting people go, but it is not sending people to the sidelines yet. And we look at the continuing claims numbers, 1,485,000. That is slightly higher than and the prior week, but uh, it is still showing that people are getting jobs uh, right away. The revised initial claims number is 
uh, 218,000. So it was actually a drop, if you want to uh, technically call it that, from the prior week. The number that really uh, may matter here the most, though, for companies going forward, non-farm productivity, it rises just three-tenths after a drop of 4.1% in the second quarter. The forecast was for half a percent. And the problem there is that uh, it means companies are paying more to get less out of everything because productivity is really slumped. Unit labor costs up by 3.5%. That is an improvement. <laughs> That's the only good news here. 10.2% in the second quarter, so uh, a, a bit of a drop in uh, unit labor costs. And then the trade balance comes in down $73.3 billion. This was kind of expected, the J-curve, uh, which is uh, economic nerd talk that will get Tom all excited. The dollar's been very strong, but it takes about a year for all that to work itself into trade. We were expecting the trade balance to widen. It's narrowed for a couple of months, but now we're, uh, we're seeing it widen again. That uh, subtracts from growth. Next stop, payrolls. 200k the estimate, Mike. What should we be focusing on tomorrow morning? Well, I would switch my focus from the number of jobs. I mean, theoretically, the we, we, we want to see a downshift in the number of jobs created, but unemployment rate has been holding in at 3.5%, and the Fed is looking for it to go to 4.4%. It was in September. Now, we Jay Powell told us to throw those numbers out. So they're thinking that unemployment's going to go higher when? I look... Yesterday was, uh, first of all, Mike, you hit the ball out of the park. You paused him twice. You know, your questions were very sophisticated and brought him to a halt. There was a point where he quoted Oaken's Law in the beverage curve back to back. This is a guy like me who really is faking it. He can't do it. <laughs> Who's advising this guy about Phillips, Taylor, Oaken, and beverage? Which part of the Fed has really got his ear. Well, obviously the monetary policy division, but they've got 400 PhDs there, I think, who uh, can explain things to him. And he does seem to be a quick learner. I mean, the one thing you see in all of the analysis is that Powell did a great job yesterday in terms of uh, setting the markets up without causing a market crash. Or a big market rally. You're killing me this morning. You're so lucky you've got the diplomatic Mike McKee around the table with us. Did you just say the chairman Powell? doesn't understand what he's talking about. No, he's getting briefed by 400 PhDs. We had cumulative tightening. That vaporized into a restatement of the terminal rate and the path to the terminal no, I think rate. You, you have to knit it together. The dollar only moved 800 I'm, points. I'm sure, I'm sure your next guest, Dean, will knit it all together he uh, will. very well for you. Can I just say what I loved about the question yesterday on the yield curve, and Bob Michael was on board with you about yeah. asking that question too, and I know you wanted to ask it before he even mentioned it, was that he said that particular part, that yield curve measurement, was still positive. And I was sat there and I was thinking, I mean, come on, by what, a couple of basis points? Yeah, it was, right. it was two ba I had it up right. on my screen when I asked the question. It was two basis points positive. We're going to get to Dean Mackey right now. John, 210 <laughs> spread comes right down 55 basis points. That's a big deal within the micro data of the day. Futures at negative 28. Dean Mackey was a force on Wall Street. He went off to a gentleman named Cohen at 0.72 and is the chief U.S. economist for 0.72, and I dare say the New York Mets as well. Dr. Mackey joins us uh, this morning. Dean Mackey, the governor of the Bank of England, just framed out a two-year recession. America is different. How different is the United States from the turmoil of double-digit inflation we see worldwide? The, the main difference, Tom, is there's just a lot more momentum in the U.S. economy. You know, you, Europe and the U.K. are dealing with a much bigger rise in energy prices, <laughs> And they're, you know, they have a war on their doorstep. Uh, the U.S. has a lot of momentum, especially in the service sector. And we think that's why, you know, jobless claims are staying low. We don't think the unemployment rate is going to rise soon. Uh, the momentum in the service sector is going to continue. Uh, the rate hikes are slowing things like housing, uh, but it's not having an impact on services. Right. And we think it'll take a long time to happen. Dr. Mackey, you were weaned at Stanford off of John Taylor and other elites. Do their rules work now? Does Oaken's Law, the beverage curb of LSE that uh, Jerome Powell mentioned yesterday, and the Taylor rule of Stanford, are those operative theories now, or are we flying by the seat of our pants? I think, you know, those rules can give some guidance, but but really the Fed's not having have hasn't dealt with the pandemic before in the post pandemic era. So those rules can give the Fed some idea of where to go, but it's really a different environment right now. 
How do you understand, Dean, the productivity levels that are not recovering at any kind of real pace and this idea that we don't necessarily see any decline in the number of uh, people who are getting jobs? How do you understand this at a time when we're hearing anecdotally, anecdotally so many companies laying people off, reducing some of their workforce through attrition? I think what, what has happened is that not long ago, most companies were having trouble finding workers. And especially in that service sector, which is 71% of US employment, there's no reason they're gonna start laying people off immediately. Um, you know, they're, they're looking at business, there's still the shift from goods to services spending happening, uh, and that's bolstering service sector employment. Um, the productivity numbers, I think, are also being weighed down by what I do think is an understatement of GDP in the first half of this year. Um, it doesn't make sense that employers were adding 500,000 jobs per month while the economy was contracting. So I think that's eventually going to get revised to something more in line with what gross domestic income was was telling us. But uh, in any case, productivity is, is pretty weak right now. Do you think that the labor market is an accurate reflection of some of the pain that's being felt in the market? In other words, is this really the metric that the Federal Reserve should be targeting right now to understand the progress that they're making in bringing down inflation? I mean, I think the labor market is an important step in the process um, in, of bringing down inflation. Now, the thing, one thing I would mention is that much of the inflation we have isn't directly tied to wage inflation. You know, we all know about the supply chain problems, the you know the goods price uh, surge that we saw during the pandemic and afterwards. Uh, but I do think wage growth and the labor is high enough, and the labor market's tight enough that it is a force on inflation right now. So the Fed ultimately does need to slow it down, but I think it's going to be difficult for them to do that. Dean Mackey, Dominic Constum, you knew him at Credit Suisse when you were at Barclays and at Deutsche Bank. Dominic Constum says this is a Fed that is super restrictive. Do you agree? I wouldn't say they're super restrictive right now. Um, you know, they are raising rates quite rapidly, so they are getting into restrictive territory. And you are seeing them having an effect. The housing market's clearly clearly contracting at this point. So their, their policy is working in that sense. Uh, but I do think that they're dealing with a different environment now where you, know, you do have still reopening that's happening in the service sector. And that means that you're not going to get the service sector uh, contracting in the way that it often does during a recession. Dean, we just want to know if Point72 has done any modelling on what would happen to the Queen's economy if Aaron Judge went to the Mets. Have you modelled that out yet? Uh, I'm working on it, but no, I haven't done it. He's that. working on it, TK. That's a scoop, isn't Come it? Come on, Dean. We got to, you know, he's working you, know on it. Uh, you you got to have Mr. Cohen. We got to get Steve Cohen and you on the show uh, together, Dean. I think you can provide cover for us to talk to Mr. Cohen about this. I mean, Aaron Judge, Texas Rangers, Aaron Judge, San Francisco Giants, yeah. Aaron Judge. S Dean, Steve Cohen's going to let Judge go to the L.A. Dodgers? It's un-American. <laughs> You can run. Uh, no, no comment. Dean okay. Mackey. <laughs> Let him go. Of point 72. Dean's oh. like ready to pull the cable out, exactly. the back of the, out the back of the laptop I, I or something. I honestly don't blame him. Dean, Dean Mackey of point 72. Thank you, Dean. TK, you in Sterling. You've got Governor Bailey speaking right now, pushing back hard against I rate pricing. Just... Cable 118, 111.83 rather. We're negative 1.8%. On a session. And buttressed off of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, folks, the Secretary of Treasury, if you will, for the United Kingdom, out with a statement right following on. And, John, as you interpret that, can they pull forward their fiscal plan to help Governor Bailey with the uncertainty? I think he'd like them to, for sure. I think yeah. he'd like them to. What a difference, though. You've got a governor of a Bank of England hiking rates, but very, very worried about rate pricing right now and what it could do to the economy, particularly in the mortgage market, pushing back against mortgage well, pricing right now and saying rates might not have to go as high as people think they might, Lisa. But it's a different economy, and I keep sure. going yes. back to this, and especially with mortgage rates that are much more prone to resetting in tandem with rates as they rise, really crimping household balance sheets much more directly. In the U.S., and this is sort of 
a problem and also a solution. It's, it's, it's both the strength and a weakness for the U.S. economy that we've immunized ourselves so significantly from a lot of these rate hikes. So the transmission mechanism yeah. just isn't there as directly as it has been in the past. I would suggest it's a different transmission uh, uh, mechanism. But what really this is about is scale. The U.S. is just that much bigger. Americans, I've found, Lisa, over the years, have no understanding of how compartmentalized and small the United Kingdom economy is. Is. We don't understand. John, is it one seventh of our size? I was tiny compared it, to America. Sure. I, I'm guessing off the top of my head. It, yeah. it just Americans don't understand that. We're blind. Sterling it's like London. Now. Boom. Heathrow. Boom. 76. Are you saying that all <laughs> What's going on? the United Kingdom is, is London and Heathrow? Yeah, you know, Bond Ooh. Street and then New Bond Street. And you go over and there's a little cutesy pie arcade you go Ooh. through. It's, Where's my it's single? London. Can we just bring up my single? <laughs> He's this, like, is, this is important. Just bring up my single, just briefly. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> to who? To the whole of the UK. I'm sorry. I'm trying. How's I'm that trying. Going out? That's it. I'm going to go now, right? The opening bout's coming up shortly. <laughs> Krishna Mali of Lafayette be College. More British. Chowdhury Probably of Mohammed's on today. Is Mohammed Chris on Harvey today? Of Wells Fargo. He's not. He was on yesterday. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. He's, you know, he's a busy I just man. wish we could once, Mohammed. He, he might have something to say about the Mets and Aaron Judge, though. I think he would. I'll give him a call. This is Bloomberg. guys are the best. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. While the Bank of England has increased interest rates by the most in 33 years, policymakers voted to lift rates 75 basis points to 3 percent. But they strongly pushed back against market expectations for the scale of further rate hikes. A BOE statement said the peak will be lower than what is priced into financial markets. U.S. authorities are investigating whether executives have been gaming prearranged stock sale programs. They're designed to prevent the possibility of insider trading. Bloomberg's learned that the Justice Department and the SEC, they're using computer algorithms to look at pre-planned equity sales by C-suite officials. Peloton has delivered a weaker outlook for the current quarter than Wall Street was predicting. The fitness company revenue was 37 percent below what it was a year ago. Still, CEO Barry McCarthy said Peloton is beating its own timeline for a turnaround. Shares are down about 90 percent over the last 12 months. And media entrepreneur Byron Allen is preparing to make a bid for pro football's Washington Commanders. Bloomberg's learned that Allen's working with an investor group. Commanders owner Dan Snyder has hired Bank of America to explore a sale of the team. If Allen succeeds in buying the Commanders, he would be the first black majority owner of an NFL franchise. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists, I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We do not believe that that recession will be sufficient to actually tame inflation and we can just let things roll out uh, as, as, as it will be. We, we need to continue to uh, deliver on our mandate and to find that interest rate that will help us uh, reach the target that we uh, defined as the 2% symmetric medium term. You know the voice, Christine Lagarde, ECB president, and I tell you, her degrees of Lisa, her degrees of freedom have changed in 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, degrees of, uh, of, of not including the guy across the channel. I mean, but this idea that they have to keep going, even if right. there is a recession, highlights hiking into pain. This have to be a confirmation or of what's so they say. Banks, yeah. uh, you don't buy it. I, I don't know if I buy it or not. I, what I know, folks, and this is important for those of you that are not sophisticates at this, this is an original Thursday looking at the Bloomberg uh, terminal. Part of that is a conversation we had earlier with Dean Mackey, formerly with Barclays, now with Steve Cohen over at Point72, and earlier with Dominic Constant at Credit Suisse, and it speaks to the heritage of Bloomberg surveillance. To give you an idea, a window into it, and not the Credit Suisse of the news now that you know, but long ago and far away, it was about Neil Soss, their head of research, into Dominic Constum on a credit desk that was read worldwide, and he had a young whippersnapper working with him, and he would turn to Ira Jersey and say, Ira, explain LIBOR. Joining us now after Dominic Constum, Ira Jersey. Do Ira, what was it like working daily with Dominic Constum? 
So he was he's such a smart guy. And at the end of the day, he's a macro economist in a big way. And and what I brought was a lot of the micro bottom up kind of work from my time working yeah. in, in uh, on the credit desk. So so that that kind of mixture of macro and micro, I think, made made for that particular group to be very special. What is a micro analysis of a five percent two year yield do to Jerome Powell? Yeah, yeah. So it basically is telling the market, or the market is starting to come come around to the idea finally that the Federal Reserve may hike to five percent and keep that interest rate there for a long time. And it's kind of taken three months of Jay Powell kind of hounding the market and saying, "Hey, once we reach the terminal rate, we're staying there forever." And the market had not been pricing for that, and now it's starting to. Not only a higher terminal rate than the dot plot had been implying, which just the market, in fairness, has been pricing for a little while, but but more importantly that the uh that, that we're pr starting to price out cuts and i think that that's the important uh information that the market kind of took on board yesterday right now i'm looking at fed funds futures about five percent plus or minus a, a couple of basis points here and there throughout the whole of 2023 is that fully priced into credit given your credit uh, expertise given <laughs> that we really haven't seen the pain that a lot of people have expected well, spreads, I think, have have the risk of going a little bit wider, particularly if you wind up with revenue growth, with top line growth of a lot of companies start to come down because we are have, going to see a significant slower economy. Um, but but keep in mind that balance sheets are much uh, stronger today than they were even you know, even three, four years ago, because when interest rates were very low, a lot of companies took that as an opportunity to refinance some of their uh, upcoming maturity. So uh, so cash is still very high on, on some corporate balance sheets. And, and and we don't expect a massive increase necessarily in defaults. You will have some, right? There's always going to be some defaults in the high yield space, and certainly weaker credits will be at risk. And and you know you want to look at you know BI Intelligence's work and in, in distress credit to find out exactly how <laughs> bad plug. that's going to be. Uh, shameless. Yeah, yeah uh, shameless plug, of course. <laughs> um, I'm on with Tom, so I have to give a shameless plug. Uh, um, <laughs> so, but but ultimately, I think uh, I, I think we we are going to have a recession. It's it, I think this question in the jury is still going to be out because of how long it's probably going to take us to to dip into that recession, um, how deep it and how long it's going to be. And the, obviously, the deeper and, and longer it is, the more likely you wind up seeing credit spreads blow out even more than they already have. Um, and uh, and you wind up seeing more defaults. Are we there yet with respect to the market? Have we fully priced and even overpriced in your estimation the average uh, benchmark rate over the next two years based on where the two year is trading? Yeah, I, I think maybe a little bit. I think we're getting there where we're, we're just about cheap to uh, a, a little bit cheap to where we think ultimately we'll go. But, you know, there is the risk here. And I think this is what the market's pricing right now. There is the risk that not that the Fed goes to 5%, but maybe they go to five and a quarter and five and a half. And I think that's one of the important uh, one of the important aspects that the market's finally gotten after a couple of months of Jay Powell hounding the market and saying, "Hey, we're going to slow down interest rate hikes." And it, and when they slow down and they get back to that twenty five basis point of meeting hike range, they can calibrate where exactly they want the Fed funds rate to go. Oh, Is that four and three quarters? Is it five? Is it five and a quarter? Is it five and a half? Like they, they that allows them to yeah. the, the slower pace allows them to kind of tweak exactly where that terminal rate's going to be. Aaron Nielsen. Sauce, long ago, I think he signed your paycheck long ago and far away. Neil Sauce <laughs> he was heated about asymmetric realities in monetary theory. We heard that twice yesterday from Chairman Powell. And the way I subscribe it is he believes he can overshoot, become, as Constam says, super, super restrictive, and then turn around and manage a more accommodative path. Is there any evidence a central bank can do that? Well, well, they can, but I think one of the things that I think Jay Powell smartly said yesterday was that the window of having that soft landing is closing. And it, it, the, the the issue is, if they do exactly what you said, Tom, then we're going to have a recession, and it might be a little bit worse than people had had ultimately thought. So so the way that, that I see this playing out is the Federal Reserve's on hold until inflation's dead, um, you know, five, five and a quarter, four, three quarters, somewhere around there. And, yeah. then, um, and then ultimately, once we get inflation back down, say, under 3% on, on the, the headline PCE number for a couple of months, then they have to cut and cut hard. 
Right. And, and I think right. that, that the market is pricing for some of that, but not right. enough. The, the, my, my surprise this morning coming in was not that we we're the bond market was selling off, but that the curve hadn't flattened a lot more. And I think that that's what, it, what we're ultimately going to see right. you know, negative 65, negative 75 basis points on the two stents curve. Them, and we haven't wow. seen that yet. And I think that that's the, uh, that's the right. next move in the next shoe to drop. It's exactly where I wanted to go. I'm going to do it with Lisa Ira. Ira Jersey, thank you so much. Looking forward to the publishing uh, of your colleagues. And you'll help out as well at Bloomberg intelligence uh, today. Lisa, I was going to go twos tens, yeah. which is a negative 55 basis points earlier. And, and uh, Ira looks for further steepening uh, inversion, I should say there. But I got to go to the real yield and to be the heart of the matter for the rest of the week, even in the jobs day, is the real yield 160, now 170. It's nonlinear. It's effect on America. Whatever the real yield you want to measure, yours is different than mine. It's not linear, and we're there where it's really going to have an impact. Another way to put this is that if you have a relative return on the benchmark full faith and credit of the U.S. Treasury, how much does that take away from the rest of the economy? How much does that take away from the rest of the financial markets that otherwise would go What's into— What's corporates doing? What are spreads doing? Well, spreads have actually come in, particularly on the high-yield side. They're constructive in distress. And that was something that people are wondering about. At what point will we see this really bleed into uh, margins in a way that really is reflected? And that's why Ira was talking about. He does expect it to happen, but they have enough cash, and they've really <sighs> locked in certain uh, certain rates for a long time. I don't know where to begin other than to say to our booking team, are we up to 20 people helping us now <laughs> piece this together? They're doing a fabulous job. We are incredibly the grateful. The guest quality today was off the chart. We hope you enjoy this conversation in economics, finance, investment. Lisa Sterling, 111.81. And, Stunning. you know, honestly, Ira was saying, kind of surprising it's not even uh, weaker considering some of the projections there.